We are now live. All right, welcome to the Santa Rosa City School Board meeting for January 13, 2021. And we will begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand and join in. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic which stands one nation under God, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, before we start, really, I begin tonight. I'm going to say this, read this to you. Again, to stress that public education does not happen in a vacuum, that it operates fully and responsibly to every single pressure point, whether it's front page news or hidden away in families. And it is during the most stressful and most challenging times that broad based, accessible education matters because public education is truly the cornerstone of our democracy. The events over the past few days at our Capitol, targeting our Congress, our elected leaders, clearly show how utterly crucial and critical it is that we provide our youngest citizens with the skills that enable critical and rational thinking, effective communication, and literacy in all its forms in order to support self-government self-governance for our entire republic. Our students must know how government works. They must know the benefits of social justice and they must understand the danger of any faction or ideology that places itself superior to our established constitutional safeguards. It's an honor and a calling to prepare our next generation of learners, next generation of voters leaders and thinkers to continue as an informed citizenry. Our work in public education matters more now as each global crisis challenges us to think and to act. Whether we do it with ample resources and in person or as right now without them, we are driven by our commitment to the future. Credit goes to those in our public education system, all staff, in every single job, that they persevere and that they continue to bring their very, very best to each learning environment, wherever that learning environment is now. We are in crisis, in crises. So strength to all those on these front lines. Thank you to all staff for bringing all that you are and all that you can muster now to teaching and learning to developing critical thinkers and doers. I know that my fellow trustees are, are behind me on this. That is an absolutely an honor to be of service in public education, knowing that we are in this together as a district with many, many moving parts on a careening train and we, that we cannot say it enough, public education matters dearly. So let's get on with our work. We have a lot of work to do. Thank you. There are no, there were no actions taken in closed session or any items considered in closed session for action in open session. Are there any statements of abstention? Seeing none. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? Seeing none. We have some special presentations tonight. Uh, for Student of the Month and for Certificate and Classified Employees of the Month for Biela Elementary School, Monroe Elementary School, and Proctor Elementary School. And I get to do those, and they are right here. So can we please bring in Biela's Student of the Month? And that would be Gabron Arafain. They are on their way over. Hi, Karan. Hey. We are so glad to see you. Congratulations. Thank you. So I get to write about you. I get to read about you, what I think your um, 
principal wrote about you or your teachers wrote about you. So here we go. Cabron was chosen to be Biela's student of the month because he has the qualities of not only an exemplary student, but he is relentless on being the best version of himself each and every day. Cabron was positively acknowledged by not only his teacher, but members on campus who shared the following. Cabron is overall a well-rounded student and deserves such an honorable recognition. He is incredibly hardworking, humble, patient, and always willing to help others through his growth mindset. Cabron is always willing to excel in academics, often asking for more challenging assignments. He actively participates in class when most students prefer not to. His courageous nature helps bring a sense of normalcy to the classroom environment. He is also very respectful of his classmates and always wants to hear the ideas of others when they are willing to share. Cabron was recommended to be a positive role model for the group of students who needed support. He is kind, patient, and respectful as a positive role model. He was willing to go the extra mile for others even when other students struggled to do the right thing. Cabron has shown such determination and resiliency through many, many and any obstacles, and he has such a bright future ahead of him. Congratulations, and that is wonderful, wonderful accolades. Everybody clap. Thanks for coming here. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations, and I hope your family is around you. Thank you, Cabron. All right, we have Biela's Certificate Employee of the Month, Heather. Heather, is she here? There she is. Hello, Heather. Congratulations. Hello. Thank you. All right, now you get to have your ears burn and get to listen all about you. Heather Hecker was chosen to be Biela's Certificate and Employee of the Month. Heather is a well-rounded professional. Her passion to serve, empathize, and support her community has allowed her to be an agent of change. Heather often celebrates her students' accomplishments by being courageous and doing whatever it takes to bring success to others. As we are in COVID learning, Heather gracefully takes on any challenges that come her way. She is positive and strives to stay innovative by seeing the glass half full. Authentic servant leadership is sometimes being an instrumental player behind the scenes and has the ability to bring forth a strong team. Heather is a humble but mighty team player who has leadership qualities that are admirable. She is well respected by her peers and community. Heather has the ability to be a support to others in ways that make her an ultimate team player. A neat fact about Heather is that she was brought back to her calling as an educator after realizing her passion. She shares the memory of being a young girl, lining up her stuffed animals, knowing she was always meant to be an educator. Heather celebrates her 15 years in education and we are blessed to have Heather in Santa Rosa City Schools. Congratulations, Ms. Heather. Everybody. Thank you. Ooh. Wonderful, wonderful. Are we bringing on Marie Wells? She is on her way over. There I am. <laughs> oh, Miss Wells? Hi. All right. Get ready for this wonderful, wonderful accolade for you. Okay. Marie Wells was chosen to be Biela's classified employee of the month. Marie serves as our lead noon duty supervisor. She often shares that she continues to work because she loves the kids. Marie leads our noon duty supervisors with little to no direction. During COVID education, she has taken the lead to support Biela distribution efforts, online engagement through recess, and a special project to teach students geography through a video segment called, Where in the World is Billy the Blue Heron? Marie is committed to being an active member on campus to support whole system engagement. 
She also serves on many committees on campus, such as the School State Council, our Tier 1 team, and takes on additional duties to support the needs of the school. One neat fact about Marie is that she has been an employee at Biella since the school was opened in 1989. This year, she embarks on her 31st year with Santa Rosa City Schools. Marie is an asset to our team and we are happy she is here with us at Biella Elementary School and we, the board and district, are very happy that you are here with Santa Rosa City Schools. Thank you. Thanks. All right, we have um, Monroe, student of the month, Salima. Um, this student is present by phone, so I will allow them to talk, but they will be unable to move over as a panelist. Hi. Hi. Okay, we're all here really waiting to hear all about you, and it's going to be really great. So, you are a student at Monroe Elementary School. It is our distinct pleasure to present Salima Larios Aparicio as a Santa Rosa City School Student of the Month for Monroe. Salima has been a student at Monroe since kindergarten and is now in sixth grade. She is in student leadership and is an active participant in whatever class she attends and she attends them all, including PE and music. <laughs> she is a great leader in small breakout groups. She consistently gets her work done and goes the extra mile on her projects and assignments. When her class met with the Children's Museum, she caught the eye of the landscape architect in charge of the multi-million dollar project, who was impressed with her questions and suggestions. Salema is able to articulate her thoughts clearly with solid reasoning. She is well liked by her peers due to her kindness and respectful nature. Her science teacher shares that she participates well in class by answering and asking questions, and she completes her independent work with rigor. She takes on optional maker projects and approaches them critically and creatively. She expresses herself well across a range of media. Salema is a solution seeker and a positive influence for her classmates. She often expresses ideas about making the world a better place. She is always willing to volunteer and help and she is a bright light. When asked about her future, she shared that she would like to become a lawyer. Congratulations, Salema. You are truly deserving of this award and we are proud to honor you tonight. Hey, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. We have Meryl Blomsmith set next. Meryl is on the way over. Oh, it was so great to have people in person at the chambers. Miss that. Here's Meryl. Hi. Okay, here we go. All about you. Ready? <laughs> it is Monroe Elementary School's distinct pleasure to recognize Meryl Blomseth as our Certificate Employee of the Month. Mrs. Blomseth has taught fifth grade at Monroe for the past five years. She has a can-do attitude and is often the first person to step up and offer to help. She has a calm and comforting demeanor and motivates students to perform at their best. She has a positive presence presence, even though we are not currently present together. Mrs. Blom Smith Seth sponsors our student leadership club where she meets weekly with students of varying grade levels. Through this club, she has organized a toy drive in partnership with Piner High School, where every K third grade student was given a toy for the holidays at a special drive through distribution. She also helps to bring a sense of normalcy to our students and staff by championing school wide spirit days. In the classroom, whether in person or remotely, Mrs. Blomseth learns and knows her students and challenges them to think and to express themselves in a positive manner. She finds a way to get the most reticent individuals to open up and share. 
She plans lessons and activities that encourage and allow for students to be actively engaged and in charge of their own learning. She has participated in CRUSH, the culturally responsive, sustaining and humanizing training for the past two years, and is currently applying these principles to her work with students. Specifically, while working with students to research new school names with an emphasis on learning about leaders from racial and ethnic minority groups. In addition, Mrs. Blomseth is mentoring a veteran teacher new to her grade level team and has recently become our newest SRTA rep. Mrs. Blomseth, thank you for all you have done to inspire and challenge your students and fellow educators. We appreciate you. Yes, congratulations. Yay, kiddos. Come on. <laughs> Oh. oh, celebrating is not the same online. Okay. And we have Ms. Campbell. Dana Campbell, if you're present, could you please raise your hand? I don't have a last name listed. I just say the first name, Dana. Do you see her, Adina? I do, Dana's on her way over. Okay, thank you. I love that, on her way over, through the air. Start video. Start video, okay. Okay, <laughs> finally, it worked. Hello. Yay. <laughs> I am new to this. I'm on okay. my phone. So, All right. So yes, I might have to be on my phone tonight too. But anyway, thank you for being here. Welcome. And sure. here we go. Okay. It is Monroe Elementary School's honor to recognize Dana Campbell as her classified employee of the month. Ms. Campbell has been an instructional assistant at Monroe for the past seven years and we were lucky enough to be able to hire her as our library assistant this year. Ms. Campbell is an extremely hard worker who is highly self-motivated. She demonstrates caring and compassion in her interactions with both students and staff, and is always willing to go above and beyond to ensure the success of our programs. In this time of uncertainty and change, Ms. Campbell has taken the initiative to coordinate twice weekly materials distribution. This has afforded our school site our school site, the consistent opportunity to safely disseminate school and curricular supplies. She works closely with teachers to ensure that they have the supplies they need for students and has been known to support teachers by taking the time to go into their rooms to find necessary materials when the teacher is not working from site. She has a kind and generous heart and truly cares for children and their families. Yeah. In her time in Monroe, Ms. Campbell has proven to be a team player who is always willing to step in and support our students and staff. Ms. Campbell is a lifelong learner who willingly puts herself forward for the benefit of our community. She is flexible and does whatever is needed. This past fall, Ms. Campbell sewed dozens of cloth masks that she then gifted to school staff. Ms. Campbell is an exemplary individual and we are grateful that she is at our site. She is a true asset to the Monroe community and I will add to the entire Santa Rosa City School District. Thank you so much and congratulations, Dana. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Virtual flowers, right? So we have Proctor Terrace our student from Proctor Terrace. Mateo is on the way over. Hi. Hello, Mateo. So glad you could be here. Okay, here we go. You are an amazing kid. So listen to this. This is great. Um, let's see. We are excited to present this award to Mateo, Mateo Martinez, a sixth grade student at Proctor Terrace Elementary who was supported by his wonderful teachers, Tina Hyatt and Tara Lyon. Congratulations to Mateo and his family. We are very proud of you. 
Mateo is a student who puts himself fully into every learning opportunity and partners with his teachers to make progress. He's super positive in every situation, pleasant to work with and appreciative of others. His teachers see him as a great problem solver, both in academic learning and interpersonally, able to stay above any drama in a mature way. He takes positive action without needing to draw attention to himself about those positive things he brings to the classroom and the group learning. Mateo is great at public speaking. He has completed a number of video assignments on this classroom seesaw platform where he clearly and concisely explains his scientific thinking. He recently recorded videos explaining how he knows the earth is around and explaining why he thinks so many people are afraid of bugs. He provides a clear introduction, personal details, and never forgets a conclusion. Communication is his strength, both in the classroom and within his written assignments. He confidently conveys ideas and contributes to class discussions on a regular basis. There's more. An especially thoughtful attribute that Matteo possesses is his ability to be humble. He is not fearful to admit when he does not have an answer or when his idea of something has changed over time. He can retell a moment from his past and draw you in with his positive attitude and warm smile. His classmates enjoy his curious nature and his company and trust him entirely because of the honesty he brings to any given situation. With just a smile, he can put you at ease and be a thoughtful listener and friend. Mateo strives to be a good person and a good friend to others. He contributes to group and class discussions and he seeks to understand the ideas of others. In a recent sixth grade writing assignment where he was asked to write a postcard to 2020, Mateo writes, it was a rough year, but we got through it. This is a student who doesn't give up and doesn't let the worst of times get him down. Instead, he lifts others up and makes every learning moment count. Without a doubt, Mateo will continue to grow as a student and as a person. And Proctor Terrace is so proud to honor him today, as is the Board of Education, Santa Rosa City Schools. Congratulations. Congratulations, Mateo. Awesome. Congratulations. So wonderful. All right, are we bringing on um, Ms. Hyatt? Uh, she is on the way. There she is. Hello. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you. We are thrilled to honor and celebrate Tina Hyatt of Proctor Terrace with this award Certificated Employee of the Month. Congratulations. Tina is a teacher of fifth and sixth graders at Proctor Terrace Elementary. Many colleagues of Tina's at Proctor Terrace have had their children in Tina's classroom. One colleague shared that every student in Tina's class was fortunate to be in that class because during a critical time of their growth as students, Tina was instrumental in their success as they graduated from Proctor Terrace and moved into their future academic careers. Tina first came to Proctor Terrace when there was an opening in fifth and sixth grade, but there's so many applicants that Tina wondered if she had a chance at the job. When she came to interview, she felt a connection right away to the school and to the staff. And we are so lucky that she was hired to embark on a wonderful career here with our Proctor Terrace community. Tina's own children went to Proctor Terrace, which helped her build many close personal and professional relationships with her colleagues. She taught a few different grade levels, but then settled in fifth grade in collaboration with her partner teacher, Susan Feige. Tina and her partner teacher think of all, Tina and her partner teacher think of all of their students as one big community, and both teachers teach all children. Tina and the fifth grade classrooms are known for many wonderful projects field trips, and their large multi-grade musical productions. This work began with a simple talent show and then morphed into a yearly musical production with set design, lighting, costumes, acting, and singing. All students who have had Tina Hyatt as their teacher understand that she focuses on the whole student, that she never gives up on working toward the success of each individual, and that she respects differences in the personality of each learner. Tina is introspective and reflective about her own teaching practice. 
She is a constant learner and always willing to try something new to help her students. She is organized, flexible, and plans ahead to identify problems and pitfalls long before they impact students. We appreciate Tina and all the contributions she has made to the success of our students over such a long period of time. We appreciate her for the person she is and for the great relationships she has built within our community. We are richer in our daily experience because of Tina. Congratulations and thank you. And the Board of Education thanks you. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you, Ms. Hyatt. And are we bringing over Ms. Frost? Yes, we are. Hello, there she is. Congratulations. All right, hope your sound's turned up. Thank you. Proctor Terrace Elementary Classified Employee of the Month. And again, remember, this is the year for each school, right? Okay. Sandra Frost is the Reading Intervention Specialist at Proctor Terrace. She works with multiple grade levels and multiple students to provide support in the most critical piece of a young child's school experience, that of learning to decode sounds, words, and phrases, of becoming a fluent reader, and of discovering joy and adventure of books and literature. We appreciate all of Sandra's contributions to the Proctor Terrace community and celebrate her with this award. Congratulations, Sandra. Sandra's daughters, Emma and Christina, attended Proctor Terrace Elementary School as primary students. Sandra started as a staff member at Proctor doing noon supervision, and then in 2008, achieved her substitute teaching license and started subbing for the teachers she had gotten to know over the years. In 2014, was hired in the instructional assistant position to take advantage of her skills in a more permanent role at the site. Sandra says this about her role at Proctor Terrace. I like the idea of helping students that are struggling and working with students one-on-one -on -one or in small group settings. I love the relationships that I've built over the years with students and teachers. It gives me great joy to see students progress, however small or big their progress might be. Some students only need a little boost. Some students I work with for a long time. Every student is unique and that is what makes my job interesting. Once again, congratulations. You are Thank a unique, you. talented staff member and we are happy to honor your efforts and dedication with this recognition and award. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to the schools who chose to recognize these individuals and um, many, many are deserving and congratulations to those folks tonight, students, certificate and classified. It's very special. All right, at this point, um, it is public comment for um, things not on the agenda. And I actually have no idea how many people would like to speak. So we are limiting public comment to an hour. Moderator, do we have a sense of how many people want to speak? Uh, we don't yet, but we could ask those who want to speak during public comment. That's a non-agenda item. Please click raise your hand at the bottom of your screen. And this is to comment for items that are not on tonight's agenda. So right now we have 11 hands raised. All right, so let's go with the full three minutes and we can start. Great, so we should have a timer that will be on the screen and you can follow along with the timer and please keep your comments 
under three minutes. Our first comment will be from Lizette. Lizette, could you please state your full name for the record before you make your comment? Lizette, are you there? That um, Lizette's hand has been up since the beginning of the meeting, so I'm not sure if maybe we might want to come back. Okay, we'll do that. Lizette, raise your hand again if you would like to comment later. So our first public comment is Veronica Jordan. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Kita Mara and Santa Rosa City School Board. Uh, my name is Veronica Jordan and I'm a parent of a kindergartner and a fourth grader at Cesar Chavez. Um, first, I want to thank Dr. Kita Mara and the district for the announcement today that you're moving forward with a return to school for K through three with a planned reopening as long as it's deemed safe on March 1st. I am so excited to see a concrete date and to hear more details in Dr. Kita Mara's report tonight. I also want to thank Will Lyon and the SRTA in advance for centering our children in your negotiations with SRCS in the coming weeks and collaborating in a way that ensures a safe reopening of our schools for our children. Board, uh, for months I have sent you all many citations of articles and podcasts and grand rounds based in science showing safety in school reopening uh, during these COVID times. I've also sent you long lists of articles showing the harm we are causing our children by having them be at home during these times. Tonight, instead of data, I just want to share a quick story. As a family physician in the community, we are actually doing hybrid medicine these days, uh, doing a lot of virtual medicine with a little bit of touch. And a couple of days ago, I saw a young woman in clinic for ear pain. Um, the patient had been seen virtually three times in the last month with increasing concerns of ear pain and then discharge and then loss of hearing. And the doctors who cared for her were all really excellent doctors, doctors who I care deeply for and who I trust to give excellent care. Over the phone, she was given first oral medicine and then topical medicine and then another topical medicine. And then finally under increasing duress, she was offered an appointment now a month after her initial concerns surfaced. And when she came in to see us two nights ago and we walked in, the cause of her ear pain was immediately obvious. She just had really bad ear wax. We flushed her ears and she was immediately cured after a month of a lot of suffering. Here's my point. We are all doing the best we can in these strange times. We are all working so hard. We all mean really well, but there is nothing that replaces in-person, live, human-to-human -human contact. Please. Get us back to school on March 1st. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Jonathan Marhenke. Hi, I'm using my dad's computer right now. Um, okay. I am Morgan Marhenke. Uh, I go, I'm 10 years old and I go to Rock Terrace. Um, good evening, Dr. Kitamara and SRCS board members. I want to go back to school. My teachers are doing a fantastic job, but I do not like distance learning because the environment is distracting me because I want, I, I don't get the same interaction with my teachers and my friends. I miss field trips and extracurricular activities like basketball. I feel that we should go back to school. Proctor already has some kids at school and to my knowledge, they haven't gotten a single case yet. I feel it's not fair to keep some students from attending school. And I think we're all getting really good at wearing masks too. Studies have shown that young children are unlikely to spread the virus. Data collected globally have previously shown that schools can open. Can we? Jonathan, you're muted. Could you please unmute? We missed the last part of your sentence. Uh, can, we? can we? Can we go back to school? <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Sorry, Morgan. Thank you, Morgan. You're welcome. Thank you. Next is Allie Myers. 
Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Thanks. Uh, so my name is Allie Myers, um, and I have a sixth grader at Proctor Terrace Elementary School. Um, and first, I wanted to thank uh, uh, Ms. Ketamura and the board um, for everything that you've been doing to work so hard behind the scenes to try to get our kids back to school. And also thank you to Veronica Jordan, who had such a uh, so eloquently requested um, that we continue with a safe return to school plan. And that's sort of what I wanted to talk about as well. I am requesting that you continue to work on this plan and commit to a safe return to school plan this year. The last three years have been devastating for our children. Um, you know, with the fires, they've had cancellation of schools multiple times. And, um, you know, we've always said, oh, it's just a few weeks, they're not going to fall too far behind. But when you start to add all of that up, along with a near year of distance learning, um, you know, the effects of this compounding on top of each other are going to be long withstanding. Um, there's many other schools around in our counties, as well as daycares that have been able to safely return to school. Um, and children are thriving, but ours are continuing to suffer through sort of this social isolation and the lasting effects of that, uh, you know, will be seen in their social development as we begin to reopen and, and move back into the schools. So please, um, you know, continue to look at Governor Newsom's new safety parameters and let's get our kids back to school as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Patrick Bailey. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, good evening, Dr. Kitamura, members of the board, administrators and attendees. My name is Pat Bailey. I'm the father of a five-year-old at CCLA and I'm eager for my son to return to school and meet his classmates. Um, I volunteer to supervise a non-instructional non cohort for the vulnerable kids at my son's school. After I satisfied the fingerprinting requirements and getting a chest x-ray to show that I don't have TB, I asked to see the space where I'd be volunteering. Uh, the principal, Rebecca Rocha, was kind enough to grant my request. I signed in, had my temperature recorded, and she showed me the room where I'd be volunteering. I saw its filtration systems, the dots, an isolation room uh, for the campus, its associated bathroom, sanitation stations, and more. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer, I care about the ventilation. It's a boring topic, but I care about it. I had a question regarding the HVAC system on the roof, which not surprisingly, uh, Ms. Rocha couldn't answer. She gave me the number of Eric Odin at the district, who's the director of maintenance and operations. I emailed him, he called me. We spent a nerdy 10 minutes talking about things like economizers, ventilation rates, uh, dampers, blah, blah, blah. My, my point is, and he, he, knew, he knew what he was talking about. I owned a consulting business for a number of years. My, my point is that I feel safe going there. I know I'm gonna to have to be careful. I'll probably wear a face shield as in addition to a mask. It's gonna be uncomfortable. My five-year-old wears masks for long periods of time at this point. I never thought he'd get there. Um, I, between, between that inspection, my reading, I've been following the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health on their COVID stuff, especially with young kids. I think I'll, I'll, I'll feel safe. I will grant you that high schools are a much more complicated problem to solve. I, I don't pretend to know the answer. Members of the board, I feel that it's actually on you, you know, but, I didn't know who to address this to, but I think it's mostly on you to provide direction, much as a city council provides direction and administrators implement that direction. I think it's on you to provide that direction and make return to school a uh, high priority. It can't go on for, it must not go on for a moment longer than absolutely necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Next public comment on a non-agenda item is Jill Jackson. I am here. Good evening. I hope you can hear me. Um, I would echo the sentiment expressed by the last speaker. I want school to open just as soon as that is, can be done in a safe manner. 
However, I do have a little bit different story to tell about as an employee of the district, I work at a school that had daycare opened just uh, right around the time of the end of October for the children that we felt were most vulnerable of falling behind because for whatever reason, a variety of reasons actually, they were not able to access curriculum through Zoom. In that very short time that our daycare has been open, it has had to close twice because even in that very, very small cohort, a number of children and employees were found to be COVID positive. And we're only talking about a very small group of students. Uh, some of the, the um, concerns that we have are, you know, uh, initial uh, notification of people who may have come in contact with those people. I spent some time this afternoon perusing our district website, looking under the department's head, under families. There is nothing that it informs our community that this has be become a problem, uh, a problem in search of a solution. It does not give a lot of confidence going forward, especially knowing at our school that we have a wait list. People anxious to take advantage of the fact that we offer such a program but may have some hesitation going forward, taking advantage of it, knowing that in such a small group of students, we have been impacted on two separate occasions to such an extent that it's required the closure of the program. Thank you. Thank you. Next public comment is Stacia Okura. Good evening, Dr. Kitamura and school board. I'm a parent of a student in TK at CCLA, and I want to thank our teachers and our principal who are working so hard during these times. <clears throat> um, I have two requests to bring to you tonight. My first request is to each and every member of this board. <clears throat> I'm asking you to please vote to approve at the next board meeting the plan to return us to hybrid instruction on March 1st, if allowed by the state. Um, you have acknowledged in the past that our students are being failed and abandoned. And it's true, it's happening, we're suffering. Can you please commit to reversing that damage, which is disproportionately affecting our most vulnerable children in this community? <clears throat> My second request is, that you communicate in more detail to families and staff about the safety protocols that are in place for return to school. I know that you have worked really hard to address safety, but I still hear a lot of talk about real or <clears throat> perceived lack of safety at schools in the teacher and family communities. Um, can you please educate us all on the measures you have taken to keep us safe and detail out what our responsibilities are to each other to ensure that we keep each other safe when we return to school. <clears throat> when concerns like these go unaddressed, those concerns turn into fears and I see fear spreading where it doesn't need to be, I think, spreading. I think just more education out to us can stop some of that growth, the fear. Um, our neighboring districts in Napa and Marin and private schools here in Sonoma County are back in school and are proving that it can be done safely. Can you please get our children back to school as soon as we're allowed to by the state of California? Thank you. Thank you. Next public comment is from Donna Prack. Hi, good, good evening. Um, I was just calling, well, everyone else that was talking about the safe return to plan, return to school plan said what I wanted to say. So I just wanted to say thank you for um, trying to keep our kids safe and thank you to the teachers. And just, I know, hopefully if our tier can go to red or it's possible to return, this could be the top priority in getting our younger kids into school by, in, by March. So. That's all, I yield my time. Thank you. 
Next public comment is Paul Poling. Hi, thank you. I'm a parent of, um, well, actually two students in the SRCS systems. So I've got a fourth grader and the kindergartner. Um, yeah, so just wanted to echo much of what's been said today, just to please get us back to school as soon as possible. Um, I know that you voted, thankfully, at the last meeting to say that you would um, get to, if I understand the resolution correctly, get back to school based on a certain um, tier, but it doesn't seem maybe quite specific enough to me. So just urging you to like um, pass a resolution saying that you'll go back to school as soon as the state guidelines um, permit you to do so. Um, and coupled with that, um, uh, it's a clear direction to the district staff um, to do everything that they need to do before that. So, you know, with some kind of deadline on it. So is that mid February, perhaps giving the other players so like SRTA staff, like a kind of the time to absorb the fact that the safety protocols and maybe go look at schools if they need to, to be reassured that everything's in place for that. I haven't heard you do that at all, actually. So I've heard sentiments about it, but nothing saying, hey, just say get this done by X date and, and get it done. <laughs> um, I am encouraged by um, rumors I've heard of what um, uh, Dr. Kinemura will be presenting today about her plans. And so that's pretty exciting, like getting back by March 1st and um, kind of negotiating as quickly as possible with SRTA, or SRTA and staff and other players um, to get things lined up. And especially the idea of putting money out there, um, resources to kind of expand the reach of summer school for the summer to try to have some ability to catch kids up as in-person instruction is more available. Um, so, you know, it's I'm a little feeling a little bit more hopeful based on um, what I think Dr. Kitamura is gonna present, but please, uh, I really wanna see the board step up and like provide direction and instruction and, and really like forcefulness around going back to school. And I haven't heard that done. To me, one sign of that is that you don't have a standing item on the agenda to talk about this. I'm sorry, but it's kind of startling to like see a resident, like a, a proposal put forth by the governor to like push towards getting back to school and resourcing things. And then we have a school district board meeting and there's nothing on the agenda about getting back to school. There's a thing on the agenda about safe routes to school, but the, no one's going to school. Like I, it just doesn't like the disconnect there. Anyway, um, hopefully there's more going on in the background than is evident to me at the board meetings, but feeling a little hopeful. So please take some resolutions and actions additionally to what you've done so far. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next public comment is Steve Spiegelman. Okay. Good evening. So I've had um, the opportunity to um, observe young children at school age during this time and young families and older families with children that are um, not going to school right now. And if you couple that with what's happening in the world right now with COVID and the fires that have happened in the last couple of years, the children, I, my concern is the children are suffering. The families are suffering enough right now. And somehow we need to get some type of situation that is favorable, not only to the teachers, the, the Santa Rosa Teacher Association, but with the, the students and getting the kids back to school. I don't know how they're gonna ever get back to normalcy. I hope that's gonna happen within the next year or so, but the sooner they get back into school, the better things are gonna be for everybody. And just, to, so people are happy, so people can feel like they're part of a society again. Everybody's been uh, quarantined and and isolated from uh, friends and and uh, activities, social activities. So the most important thing is to get the children back to school, and I want it safely. But also don't forget about the teachers. We need to keep them uh, in the loop and, and talk with them so we can make sure that everybody's on the same page and we can get to that March 1st deadline because I see that there could be complications with that if everybody's not on the same page. And it's gonna be devastating if these children can't get back 
into the schoolroom ASAP and March 1st. So I'm asking you to do whatever you need to do to meet the requirements, to meet the requirements of teachers and come to a solution that's going to get us back on track. And I'm, I'm guessing there'll be a lot of happiness for the children. Um, and that's, that's what I'm looking at. So thank you. Thank you. Next public comment on a non-agenda item is Sam Daw. Sam, are you there? Please unmute. Sorry about that. No problem. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good evening, Dr. Kitamura and SRCS board members. <clears throat> My name is Sam Daw, and I am the parent of a second grader in Santa Rosa City Schools. Tonight, I am calling to ask you to commit fully to a safe return to schools as soon as the state allows us to do so. I believe that the harm to our children and our community of not being in schools is tremendous and long lasting. Children are not thriving despite all the hard work of teachers and families to make this new system work. Distance learning is not working, and I have seen this firsthand. We've had nearly a year to get a better understanding of the virus and what we need to do to safely open schools, and we know it is possible. Our neighboring counties have reopened their schools successfully, and our own daycares have reopened as well. Please use Governor Newsom's new safety parameters and incentive money to keep kids and teachers safe and get us back to school this academic year. Finally, uh, I would implore the board to engage in meaningful discussions with teachers to get them back into the classroom as soon as we possibly can and as soon as safety would allow. Thank you. Thank you. Next public comment is Monona Hevelin. Good evening, Dr. Kitamura and members of the board. Um, I just wanted to speak to um, share my appreciation for all the work that you have been doing to on the return to school plan and all the work to continue delivering educational services remotely. It is double duty or triple duty for everybody and it is a tremendous effort. Um, however, I think we have to double down on working uh, hard to figure out how to get back to school. And I would like to, um, encourage there to be dialogue. It's so hard in the time of COVID when we all can only speak to each other on computer screens with the little Brady Bunch boxes. Um, but that really needs to be a coming together of the um, teachers union and parents and teachers and the district to figure out what is a safe way to return to school. And um, I'm really encouraged by what Dr. Kitamura is going to, um, the announcement that just came out over email. It sounds like there is a great plan. So I'm not gonna take up too much more of your time. I just uh, wanted to encourage that we make an effort to um, reduce uh, classroom sizes. I agree with the MOU that cohorts should not be more than 16 students. And I think that would be, um, I hope that we can get there. And, um, I also uh, hope that we will have summer school options for uh, students to make up lost time. And uh, I'm not as committed to March 1 as just that there being uh, everybody working together towards getting kids back safely as soon as it is possible. And um, so I, I appreciate your attention to this and the leadership and I know it's complicated and um, thank you for all of your work on it. I give the, the rest of my time. <laughs> Thank you. Next public comment is from Melissa Madigan. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yes. I am a teacher with SRCS and a parent of three, two are school age, one is TK and one is third grade. And I'm fortunate that they are actually both thriving. They have amazing teachers. They have a great support staff at home and they're doing quite well. This I know is not the norm and I'm grateful for their successes. 
I am worried about the vaccine and the fact that getting a vaccine shouldn't be a green light to open schools. I'm excited to get my vaccine, but I worry that my students that I come back to, as well as their families, are not so lucky and will not be vaccinated when I'm vaccinated. And that when I go to school, I will be exposed to the virus and will thus be a carrier and bring the virus home to my newborn son, my two school age children, my elderly mother and my husband. That's a big concern of mine is that even though I am hopefully to be vaccine sooner rather than later, I'm going into a classroom where those will not be vaccinated and I will thus be a carrier and bring it home to my family who I cannot protect. Another worry of mine is I know families are given the option mm -hmm. to say if they wanna be hybrid or distance learning for the rest of the year as teachers, we are not given the option. We are told to begin and we must begin. And I feel that the option should be there and I hope that that will be looked upon and we will be given the option. Um, my last statement as regards to, I feel that a lot of times teachers are said to be like nurses, that we should just mask up and go to school and we'll be fine. However, unlike nurses, we are not trained adequately in regards to viruses. We don't have the adequate um, supplies for us. And we are not seeing just one person at a time, but a classroom. And it's frustrating being compared to that of a nurse or a doctor. I miss my students dearly, and I know that some are struggling, but I hope to return when it's safe for all. And when I can go in knowing that my family will not be risked at me going in and bringing home a deadly virus to them. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next public comment on a non-agenda item is Anastasio Tovar Rose. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Buenas noches. Me escuchan? Les quiero pedir a todos de la comunidad que hablan español que tienen preguntas sobre volver a la escuela que sepan que hay cinco miembros de la mesa directiva que hablan español y están presentes ahorita. Es Omar Medina, Everett Flores, Stephanie que no está y Alegría de, y Omar López. So la comunidad que habla español que tienen preguntas si quieren regresar a la escuela, que sepan que estos miembros están y les pueden responder todas las preguntas que tienen. Gracias. All right, thank you for your comment. And next for public comment on non-agenda items is Catherine Benton. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. So thank you uh, to you all for allowing us to speak on non-agenda items. Um, we've heard a lot tonight from parents of um, elementary school students. I am actually a parent of a high school student, a high school senior this year. And as you are all probably very aware, this has been an extremely challenging year for our teens and our high school students. The seniors this year have had enormous pressure and um, just astounding obstacles to deal with this year. They lost half of their junior year last year when we stopped going to school in person. Excuse me, they didn't lose their, their year. They had their year incredibly altered when they stopped going to school in March. And again, they're really having an incredible time this year with their senior year, not being able to go to school in person. I know that the district has made some alternative graduation plans. Um, for the class this year, which has, has been pretty impressive. However, um, I have encountered some difficulties with some of those um, new requirements or flexibilities, specifically with some of the state requirements, something as simple as a PE class, um, something as simple as changing from an honors class to a non-honors class. Um, has been met with some resistance. And it's been 
not only extremely frustrating as a parent, but pretty disturbing for my student to hear that she must complete these requirements, which for some have nothing to do with the college that she will be applying for or the program she's interested in. So I'm speaking tonight on behalf of seniors and really I'm hoping and encouraging the board when these situations come up to please, please be as flexible as possible um, with meeting these state requirements for something as simple as PE when these kids are hopefully, they're outside doing things because we can't, they're going to parks, they're running, they're doing all kinds of things, but also um, with regard to the academics as well. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Next public comment is from Amy Bowen. Thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Um, I just want to reinforce what the last speaker said, but in a different angle. I'm a parent of a senior at Santa Rosa High School. I am very appreciative of the work you're doing on getting the K through three and special needs students back to school, hopefully by March 1st. Actually, I did not receive any new email from Dr. Kitamura because perhaps that was only sent to the elementary parents. I don't know, but I haven't received that yet. It appears to me that uh, secondary students have been disregarded in these plans. I know it was going to be a more complicated issue to get secondary students back to school, but I still think it needs to be addressed. The way that it's complicated is because of the way that a secondary school is set up with changing classroom, but it's also complicated because you're working on an MOU that was agreed upon with the teachers union based on CDC recommendations that are now very outdated and old. And so I would beg you to not disregard secondary students, reconsider including them in the return to school and not just ignore their needs. My student is doing fine academically. He's going to be okay on paper, but all of the secondary students are suffering from their isolation. It's not just a academic issue that you have successfully addressed by giving alternative graduation plans. You need to address the whole child needs of the secondary students which are not being met. Please, 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 I implore you not to ignore your secondary students when you work on getting them back to school. Um, simple personal example of how I feel that we have ignored our secondary students is my student is in a class of 46 for this spring semester. And even if there could be a hybrid plan put into place, obviously that class of 46 students would be excluded from any potential hybrid plan. Please stop ignoring our secondary students. And there's not more I can say because I didn't really prepare a student, a, a statement tonight. But um, thanks for what you're doing. Please do a little bit more for our secondary students. Thank you. Thanks, next is Kim McKay. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great, great. Um, I wanted to express my appreciation to the board, the cabinet for all the time and work you've been putting into getting us back to school safely. I hear a lot of people talking about let's go back when it's safe. And, um, and I really am on board for that, um, but at the same time, people in the same sentence, they're saying, let's go back when it's safe. They're also saying, let's go back on March 1st. And I think we need to understand that a virus doesn't go by a calendar. And I don't know that um, just giving an arbitrary day will actually be make it safe for us to go back. So um, yeah, I have that concern. And um, I feel like a lot of pressure is being put on the school board and our cabinet and the teachers in, you know, who have been working hard. Everybody has been working twice as hard as usual. People are frustrated. I'm frustrated. Parents are frustrated. Kids are frustrated. But it's a virus. We can't push people to get to make a virus go away. It's, it doesn't make sense. 
We can't just wish something away and wish something was safe. Um, I would like to say that distance learning is working for my class. My kids are doing well. It's not ideal. It's definitely not something I would have ever wanted to do or enjoy doing. It is not convenient at all. Um, but my perspective is different this year on success. My idea of success is that we don't lose anybody. That, that's a real situation. I have lost someone this year from COVID. When I get the um, data off American Academy of Pediatrics of a 0.02% death rate with 15,000 students, that's 30 kids. That's 30 kids. If all of our kids got COVID, which they wouldn't, that's a lot. And I'm really surprised that parents are willing to take that chance with their child. Um, I won't even go into the, the statistics regarding the adults and what their death rate is and how many teachers and employees we have. So bottom line is I feel like when we have a worldwide pandemic, sometimes we need to shift our idea of what a successful school year is. If we lose zero people, we will have had a successful school year. Thank you. Next comment is Pamela Karbowski. Good evening, Dr. Kitamora and the school board. My name is Pam Karbowski and I am a PE teacher at Brook Hill and Biela Elementary. Please just remember, number one, numbers of COVID in our county are rising daily. Number two, we are in the purple tier. Number three, people are continue, continuing at all ages, unfortunately, dying. Number four, just as Jill stated earlier, COVID is being transmitted at our school sites when we aren't even in session with hundreds of kids on campus. Number six, our state is in lockdown once again. And this time we don't have a date on when we will get out of that lockdown. We don't know when that will happen. Number seven, can we really compare those counties around us who are back to school to ours? Is that realistic? Number eight, we as teachers want desperately to return, but we only want to return when it is safe for our students, their families, the staff, and our community. Thank you. Thank you. Next comment, um, if you could please state your full name for the record. I have Iwana as part of your name. Hi, um, Lawana Gido. I'm a parent to a child at the CCLA, a child at Steel Lane, and another child at Ridgeway. And I just want to say that I'm very concerned because I, I, I've been hearing parents say, oh, we, you know, we're concerned about COVID, but, we, you know, our kids need to be in school, you know, by March 1st. I don't think that's right. As the other parent said, it's a pandemic. It doesn't have a timeline. Um, I'm very concerned. Um, two of my children are, are IEP students. Um, they both have um, compressed immune systems. Um, so I'm scared for my children going back to school, even though they will be wearing a mask. I heard somebody say 16 children to a classroom. I've seen the classrooms. Those classrooms are not, I mean, they're fairly good size, but how are you going to keep 16 children six feet apart from each other in a seven hour period? Um, I know that they're not going to be, you know, they're not going to be able to use chemicals to clean everything that they've touched, desks, light switches, 
their, you know, pencils, tables, all of that. I'm very concerned about it. Um, I work at a private school. We're only allowed to have um, 68 people in our classrooms. And it's very hard to keep us at a six feet distance. It's hard for us to keep our rooms um, contained germ-free. Um, so I think personally in my aspect, I think it is best when the state says that it's safe, I think the numbers need to be reduced. I believe that there needs to be somebody in there cleaning continuously throughout the day and not expect these children and a teacher to do it themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Our next comment is from Rochelle or Vivian. Could you please state your name for the record? Okay. Hi, my name is Rochelle Porzio. I have um, one daughter in fifth grade at the Santa Rosa French American Charter School. And um, good evening to all of you. Um, thanks for hearing the public comments um, for the non-agenda items, um, which I was, I was a little dismayed that um, return to school wasn't on the agenda. So um, I'm hoping that going forward that it will, it will be on a priority to talk about. Um, I'm asking you to fully commit to a safe return to school as soon as possible. And I've been listening to the other commenters and validating the fear of um, going back to school and being safe and worried about getting COVID. But there's been many, many studies and people across the nation and across in Napa and Marin where they've been proving that return to schools, at least K through six, has been very safe. There's been very little transmission and that we don't need to recreate the wheel, that we can look to these other schools, these other districts that have, have it down and feel like they've, they've done a good job. They've had very little transmission and, and learn from them. So I would like to hear about some discussions about people bringing different ideas of how to keep our teachers safe, the staff safe, what, what kinds of things need to be done? What are the checklists for each school that need to be done before we can open safely? I'm, I'm not committed to a March 1st, I'm committed to when it is safe. And California has said that it's safe return to school, that we open as soon as that's possible. And, that can only happen with a good plan in place. And that's where these discussions have to take place. We have to make a plan for the eventual opening of schools, when, whenever that is, whether it's February 15th or April. Um, so we need, to, we need to have these discussions. We need to know the barriers to um, why we wouldn't be able to open. And I know there's many schools in the Santa Rosa City Schools and each school has its own unique problems at their at the facilities about I know that they need to have an isolation room with a bathroom and so many staff and different resources and I just want to make sure that all those things are being talked about and ready ready at the go so when we get the green light to safely return that those that those are those will happen I would like um, more communication and transparency um, about what- Thank what... you, your time is up, thank okay. you. Okay, my- And the next public comment is Robert Johns. Hi, my name is Robert Johns. I'm a school psychologist with the district's preschool program. Um, I've been seeing students in person for assessment for quite some time now, and I also work on campus on a daily basis. 
I have seen firsthand that we do in fact have all necessary safety precautions in place and we are ready to expand our in-person learning options. I have previously heard some express fears that young students won't wear masks or stay socially distanced, making a return to school unsafe. However, I've worked with two, three, and four-year-olds with extensive support needs who are able to keep their masks on. Um, the community preschool on our campus has been open and I often see them outside and they're wearing masks and staying socially distanced as well. And they're only three and four years old. My experience along with all the research out there leads me to feel confident that we are able to return to school safely. Schools all over the country and the world have been open for quite some time, even during times when there's high community COVID rates and there is no evidence that in-person learning significantly increases COVID transmission. Please support the efforts to open schools soon. Thank you. Thank you. And President Fong, there are no more hands raised. Thank you. And um, we don't usually respond to any public comments, but I'm going to say this. I think that there's great fear out there and there's great anxiety out there with all good reason. And uh, many folks, of course, want to be back and, and kids and many teachers want to be back and we all want to see our students. The question is about why we don't have this as a standing agenda item every single meeting. I'm going to say that's because things keep changing. And it would be like us chasing our tails and it would be a lot of conjecture and it would take up a lot of our bandwidth because we have many, many other things going on. Also, we need our staff to be secure and knowing that this is what they're doing right now, that they're full speed ahead on doing the very best job they're doing right now in distance learning, remote teaching. Um, I know that the board and uh, our superintendent are quite responsive to people who still need more information and want to be heard. You can write to us all, you can write to us whenever you want, and that we will be bringing this back at our next board meeting when there are other things to do um, and other things and, and different information and some more definitive information. And so I think also what I've heard is um, transparency. And so there are many, many ways that we are getting information out to families and uh, Superintendent Kitamura is, will speak to that. And she's gonna speak to, uh, the whole return to school today also in her uh, report. So thank you for everyone who took the time to, sp to speak. We, we heard all of it and we are, we are considering all of it. Thank you. We have a CSU report, I believe tonight. We do have a report this evening. I will be moving over Ms. Aponzo. Hello. It's nice to see everyone this morning or this evening. I'm still stuck in the morning yet. Um, my name is Tammy Afonso, president of CSEA Chapter 75 Classified Employees of the District. For those of you who do not know who we are, we're your secretaries, we're your custodians, we're food service workers, we our groundskeepers, we are the maintenance department, we are payroll, we are HR. That's where you will find us. We're the people who greet you as you come in the doors. Um, good evening, um, everyone. President Fong, Superintendent Kitamura, school board members and students board member. First, I would like to welcome you two new classified employees to Santa Rosa City Schools, and we hope you enjoy working with the great staff and students once we return to sites. We'd like to congratulate two members who were promoted to two, uh, to, I'm sorry, two members who were promoted to new, new positions. Farewell to two who have moved on to other opportunities. We wish a happy retirement to one of our members who has de dedicated over 20 years to Santa Rosa City School District and the students. Your services will definitely be missed.
Our classified members are looking forward to the negotiating teams coming back together. We will be providing the district with multiple dates. We believe that we can mutually agree on a few to restart the process that was stalled in October due to the unknown st state budget for California's uh, schools. Along with those who spoke this evening, sharing their concerns for the safe return process, the classified employees of the district also look forward to working together with SRCS and SRTA to bring the students and staff safely back to our schools. We also look forward to the time when we are able to put the COVID-19 virus behind us and get back to educating our students in person at all sites. I thank you for your time this evening. Thank you, President Alfonso. Uh, we have an SRTA report tonight, I believe. President Will Lyon. He's on his way over. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All right, I've successfully unmuted so I can save $5. Uh, good evening, dear President Fong, Dr. Kitamura, and appreciated respected members of the school board and the committee and the community. I would like to say happy new year to all of you. I intend that to be a prayer and an affirmation, not my assessment of the first two weeks. I want to address two things tonight. One is the return to school plan that the parents are bringing up. Uh, rightfully so. And the other is SRTA has sunshined its openers for uh, negotiations for next year and beyond. First, it is critical that everybody knows nobody wants to go back into the classrooms and teach our students face to face the way we did it pre COVID more than the educators, including SRTA members. When it is safe, Nobody is arguing that it's better to be on Zoom. We know students learn best, almost every single one of them learn best in the classroom and that teachers teach best in the classroom. We also know it's not safe right now. The virus is out of control and our district has not yet demonstrated the capacity to follow all the safety procedures. Um, I understand, um, Dr. Kitamura put out uh, the standard Wednesday uh, memo and it stated March 1. And I wanna clarify that my understanding is we are gonna be ready to open March 1 if the virus allows, if the state allows, that's the goal. That doesn't mean that we're gonna open up March 1 no matter what, that's my understanding. And I think that's an important um, distinction as Kim McKay spoke earlier tonight the virus doesn't go on political timelines. The virus will be done when the virus is done. Uh, the, vi uh, the vaccines will help. We're, we're, there are a lot of good news coming out about that. Uh, but we do support that goal of getting ready for March 1. We're not committed to going in March 1, no matter how bad things are. And we also have to make sure that our district can meet the has the capacity to meet those guidelines. Very gently, I wanna say, that we have heard district officials state in public, in these board meetings even, that SRS, SRCS is currently meeting all those guidelines. And the board needs to know and the community needs to know, um, we're not yet meeting all those guidelines. And it's having, uh, it's causing tension between parents and teachers if the parents here were meeting them all and the teachers say, we don't wanna go in yet because it's not safe. Um, we do wanna go in, but we don't think it's safe yet. The problem is it's pretty hard to tell. You can't Google it. You can't weigh it on a bathroom scale. We're ready or not. It's a lot more complicated than that. To that end, well, I so say parents are asking very valid questions and I, I'm, I'm gonna go off script just a moment. I really want to thank the parents for coming in and stating their case so respectfully. Teachers have too often 
been the butt of accusations and all this, you know, I'll, I'll, I won't go down that road, but you, we've all seen teacher bashing. And it means an awful lot to me that our parents want to work with the teachers in the district to get it right instead of coming out and blaming teachers. I really want to thank the group that came out and spoke tonight, sincerely. They're asking a valid question. What do we need to do so that teachers will feel safe? To that end, SRTA has organized a parent and community webinar so that we can work to answer some of those questions from our perspective in a thorough, thoughtful way that would be inappropriate for me to do in this report. Um, that save the date when uh, school board members are invited, community members are invited, certainly the staff and the parents. Um, January 26, from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m., uh, we're gonna have that webinar. And we are currently taking questions from our parents so that we'll have time to research and provide thoughtful answers at that time. So our goals are to answer those parent questions and to respond to parent concerns. And we are going to roll out, we've talked about this with the cabinet, but we wanna introduce it to the board tonight and to the community if they haven't heard it yet. We're gonna roll out an SRTA COVID dashboard with metrics that we're pulling from our MOU, from the state and county guidelines, from the CDC, uh, based on the dashboard that was created by the San Francisco Unified School District so that we can show our community members what the eight things are that we have to do before we can go in and how much progress we've made on each one of those things. We invite the parents and the members to join us and to ask those questions now so that we can provide those thoughtful research answers. And you can find the link to a Google form. Everything's on Google now. Um, you can find it on our Facebook page and you can also find it on our website, which is wearesrta.org. Um, and we would also like to invite the district to work with it, us on that dashboard before it goes live with a goal towards being able to stand shoulder to shoulder and demonstrate to our community that we are ready. And if we aren't, where we, where we need to catch up and work on that together. Um, so we hope that you'll join us then. And again, thank you for the parents for your respectful comments tonight. The second thing is about negotiations. Um, <laughs> President Trump's actions earlier this week have sucked all the oxygen out of the room. So it, you'd be forgiven if you didn't know that SRTA sunshined our openers this week. Uh, later tonight, super awesome mega SRTA champion, Catherine Howell, our chief negotiator, will talk more about those specifics. Um, in, in the sunshine letter, which is in the agenda, which represents an immediate jump to the state average in total compensation. I urge the school board uh, to accept the proposal so that SRTA can, so that SRCS can be a destination district for our students and staff and for the community. If you did read the Sunshine Letter, you may have a little sticker shock when you saw our opening proposal. Um, it's a bigger proposal than we've asked for in the modern era. So you'd be forgiven if you had some sticker shock. It's important that you know that we did not make a big ask because we're greedy. We made a big ask because even after an successful, a successful negotiation last cycle, at which time we were 17% behind the state average, now we are 15.3% below the state average. And we all know that we live in one of the most expensive cities for educators in the nation. This is having a devastating effect on our ability to attract and retain the quality educators our students need to succeed. The good news is that we can afford to take action right now. Three years ago in our three-year budget, and in every three-year budget I've seen in the last two decades, 
at the end of that three-year budget, we are broke as a joke. We got no money anywhere, barely enough to maintain the 3% minimum required by state law. That happened three years ago. Now, three years later, we have $18 million more than the district projected we would have. Going back three years, that was before COVID. That was before some of our fires. <laughs> God bless us all. That was before SRTA achieved a 7% raise over two years and a $15 healthcare contribution. So even with those increases to our budget after that three-year budget was presented to the board, we still have $18 million more than we thought we were going to have. Further, if we would have taken the 1% offer that we rejected last time and put all of that into reserves, we'd be at closer to 30%, $30 million of unrestricted reserves. So I wanna caution the board from from believing that that budget is set in stone. It isn't. We haven't made any money yet. We haven't spent any money yet. And if every single year we say we're gonna be broke as a joke in three years, we'll never take care of our teachers and we'll never close this gap so that we can be a destination district for students and staff and the community. So I understand the board sets the parameters. I'm encouraging you to give the district negotiating room to get us to the state average and accept our proposal. Lastly, and gently, I need to give the district a tardy slip for uh, CSEA negotiations. Um, our lowest paid CSEA members are making $1.99 less than everywhere else in the city. And it's already having a, a devastating ability for us to attract the support staff that every single one of us knows we need for this district to succeed. So uh, go ahead and take care of them first and do it as fast as you can if you don't mind, but our contract uh, su um, sunsets, as in we will be out of contract on July 1, and I have every expectation respectfully that we are gonna be able to work together and close this contract and with, it, and with an agreement that every one of us is proud of and that our district can afford before July 1. And I thank you very much for listening to me. Stay strong, everybody. It's going probably next week's probably just going to be tough as this one. Get, hang in there. Thank you, President Lyon. Superintendent Kitamura, you have a report for us. I do, I do. It's a report that's nor normally um, not that not uh, this long. I usually don't go this long, but. I didn't give reports in the last couple of meetings, so I am taking back a little bit of time. First thing I'd like to start with is that um, my appreciation for the various meetings I've had with various stakeholders. I, I greatly appreciate that. Um, I also want to say that in, with regards to an agenda, agenda item for this meeting, please know that the governor's plan had to go through budget and the budget was not released until Friday after this agenda was uh, developed. And so I, I want you to, to remember that when it did come through on Friday uh, is when I decided I do need to put something in my superintendent's report to be able to um, speak to and, and talk about. Um, so, so that's why it's in my superintendent's work report as instead of an agenda item. What I did share is that um, I could have uh, annotated my superintendent's report uh, to, to show that there was going to be a talk about return to school. And so that's something that I will consider in the future. So let's get into the information that I want to share with you tonight. Um, so I'm going to share my screen right now. And I just want to warn you, my mouse has decided to go crazy. So uh, there could be some flipping around of things as my mouse goes nuts on me. Um, can everyone see the um, PowerPoint? Okay, just give me a thumbs up and then I'll continue on. Okay, great. So tonight I am going to talk about in-person instruction um, and, oops, I've got to go over here. Um, what I'm going to be talking tonight about tonight is our local um, data. I'm going to talk about the governor's safe school for all. And again, it was proposed, it's a proposed plan until we kind of get a lot of some things in order. 
Uh, Assembly Bill 10, I'm just gonna review that just a little bit because we heard a lot about that in-person instruction and distance learning. Um, another plan that we are required to complete through Cal OSHA, uh, I'm gonna speak to that a little bit. Um, staff, the cabinet did an awesome job today. There are so, not today, over the week, there's so many different requirements. The complexity of what is required of a school district to operate, to um, educate, comes from every angle. And so I asked if they would do a, a crosswalk, like bring all the different things that are required together and put it together in a graphic organizer so we could easily see what's required of us, when it's due, and where we are in progress of it. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about the readiness, our readiness uh, for in-person in instruction, uh, being ready, and then finally, the priorities that uh, we'll be focusing on. See, this is my crazy uh, mouse. I apologize. So, as of today, uh, just as you all know, we are deeply into the purple tier uh, of the original, no, the second system from Governor um, Newsom. Um, our case rate today, I had 33.5, but in the newspaper today, I saw that it was 47.5 um, countywide. Um, deaths right now are 219. Um, with regard to surveillance testing, we are going to suspend or end our contract with a company called Curative. Um, as they uh, work out their issues with the FDA, uh, we will um, be we will be working together with the county to determine what what company we will go with for this. Um, in terms of vaccinations, uh, there have been 2.7 percent vaccinated according to the data at the county website. Um, educators are in Group 1B, so right now they're in one um, and Group One. 1A, uh, we are in group 1B educators. The county has informed us it will be sometime in February that we will begin. Um, there are, I forget the number, uh, Dr. Harrington can tell us when we get back, but thousands of people in the educational world, world to vaccinate. Um, and so where we fall in that February timeframe, I'm not sure yet. Um, and also remember it's a, it's a two vaccination process. So between the first vaccination and the second vaccination, it's gonna be 28 days. And so there is a, a time in there before you get finished with both vaccines. So the Governor Safe School proposal, um, it, it's based on four pillars. And I think you've probably seen this, but I, I want to be able to put this PowerPoint up on our website so it can be accessed by, people, by the public. Um, it talks about funding, it talks about safety and mitigation. It talks about oversight. It talks about transparency and accountability. Um, the biggest part of this funding was what we were waiting for to, to hear about, um, because as we know, the things that are required to open up safely are definitely going to cost uh, a lot of money. So um, those are the four pillars. I'm going to go a little bit deeper into the four pillars. And again, this is going to be up on the website, so you will have this available for you. Um, as you can see, uh, the uh, funding would be $450 per ADA uh, and up to $700 based on our LCF, LCFF. So our unduplicated students um, puts an additional amount of money on there. For Santa Rosa City Schools, we're looking at in excess of $6 million um, when we apply for this fund. Um, I do want people to know, this is sometimes not sad, that this is coming out of Prop 98 money. So it is not new dollars, it's coming out of the money that funds our base funding. Um, so it's gonna be interesting to see what happens later on down the road if this money is pulled from Prop 98 um, to pay for bringing back our students. You can apply February 1st, um, you can also apply March 1st. My goal is to apply for the February 1st because if we wait till March 1st, um, it's, a, it's a lesser dollar amount. It's 337 versus 450. And so we are working towards that. And I wanna say at this point too, the return to school plan that we've been working on since last spring is, is the source for so much of these plans and the documents that we have to produce that we really are ahead of the game. We're, 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 I'm not concerned about the February 1st in terms of our documentation and the plans. 
Um, I, I, the one, uh, it's not a concern. The one thing that could be a uh, bit of a bit more complicated is our work together with um, SRTA and CSEA uh, and getting those uh, MOUs uh, revisited. So what does it mean uh, under the governor's um, proposal? It means KA through two, second grade and KA 12 special education uh, English learners are homeless and foster youth um, will return to school. Uh, the, and then grades four through six uh, can return at a, a point after that, a couple weeks after that. Um, but they are really recommending that we focus on KA through two first. Uh, as I said, we have to negotiate the impact um, for a safe environment with SRTA and CSEA. Um, our, safe, our site safety plans, the teams are working on that right now. Uh, the county public, we don't have, we have the information, we don't have the template. The template has not been produced by the state yet. And so uh, as soon as we get it, we have all the information that we need to uh, input it. The, uh, the, this process eliminates the waiver process. So um, that won't be in play, in play. The next pillar is safety and mitigation. Um, and this is what we're talking about, the seven day average of 28 or fewer cases per 100,000. At the time I did the, the PowerPoint, it was 33.5. Again, what I said, what I saw today, it was up over 40 um, cases per 100K. Uh, and so until it drops below 28, we will not be able to open under the governor's plan. Um, vaccinations, as I said, are expected uh, in February with a 28 day for the second vaccination. Um, surveillance tested was gonna be by curative. Again, we are now gonna work with the county on a, a different company. Uh, if we are between 14 and 28 cases per 100,000, we will actually need to test once per week. If we are below 14,000, we can go to the other every other week. So if you think about that in terms of the immensity of the number of surveillance tests we have to um, uh, provide, uh, it, it, it is a um, it is daunting thinking about it, but that's why we have the time to get the process in place. Um, contact tracing is conducted by our district right now. We know that when we open for our students, we're gonna have to have site-based contact tracers because right now we're overwhelmed at the site, at the district level with the number of uh, contact tracings we have to perform. Um, PPE uh, needs to be available, face masks, shields, gowns, uh, gloves, um, as you can see by the list. And so that is a piece of it. Um, and I'll talk about that later. And then dashboards uh, by the state. The dashboards in the governor's proposal talks about the state. Um, the county already has dashboards. And uh, tonight I will share with you the dashboard we, that we have created. So moving on, these third pillar is oversight and assistance. Um, and so this is that safety plan that we're waiting for the template from the state, but our work together with our return to school plan um, is, it has the ability to populate that um, really, really well. Um, Cal OSHA, as I said, has a plan. Uh, we're already, we already have that plan completed. Um, the last part of that plan is to um, meet and confer with our two bargaining units. So the, once we submit the plan to the county, the county has five days um, and the uh, COVID, the CPP is the COVID Pre protection plan. That's not a part of the governor's proposal. I just want you to know that, but we are still going to present it January 27th uh, for board approval. We're gonna cover every base, every base, every plan. Um, transparency and accountability. We heard a lot about that tonight. So that is the state dashboard and hotline, a county dashboard, and they have a hotline. And then our own SRCS dashboard, um, along with an email address that is listed here, questions at SRCS. We're gonna take and respond to those questions and create an FAQ. So that's the governor's oops, assembly bill 10. So here's the listing and I'm not gonna read them all to you about assembly bill 10. Um, the, it crosses over somewhat with the governor's um, plan for safe schools, uh, but it is primarily, um, it, it's primarily about, um, um, what would you say? 
standards around safety and equipment, um, uh, some things around learning loss mitigation, um, funding for uh, childcare, on-campus childcare. So, it, you know, they, there's some things around uh, transparency and cohorts. So Assemblyman, Assembly Bill 10 is also a document that we are um, using as our preparation guidelines uh, for in-person instruction. And then here are the, the requirements for the Cal OSHA um, protection plan. And again, I'm not gonna go through and read all of these. Um, it will be available, but there's areas in which Cal OSHA is requiring us to be prepared and have a plan for. And as I said, that plan is actually complete already. Um, and uh, it's just one more layer of protection and safety that uh, we want for all of our staff as they return to in-person instruction. So here's the, um, we're gonna show the crosswalk. And this is, I don't know if you've, if anybody's had the opportunity to see this or been there, but this is the crosswalk at Shibuya um, where there's five different ways in which to go. And that's how, kind of how I feel like with all of these different plans. Um, so staff has uh, worked on this and on the left-hand side, uh, you will see all of the areas that our requirements for the various plans, the various laws, our current SRTA MOU, our CSEA, current CSEA MOU, and where we are with it on our return to school. And I'm gonna turn it over to St um, Steve Mazzara and Rick Edson to speak to this a little bit about what does it mean to be ready, ready by March 1st. Um, so could you speak to this uh, gentleman? Sure, Dr. Sure. Kimmer, are you, you able to make it a little bit bigger for us? Sure. How's that? Perfect. Deputy Soup, you're up first. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, as Dr. Kitamura said, uh, this was a crosswalk uh, to show uh, the different uh, plans, including the MOUs with SRTA and CSEA across the top. Uh, and the inclusion of these items uh, going down the left side of the spreadsheet. Uh, an X signifies that it is included. Uh, not applicable means that it was not mentioned in those plans. Uh, and a few are labeled new requirement based on uh, the governor's plan that was released as well as AB 10 that's going through the education committee right now. Uh, it's important to note uh, as we look at this with the uh, green and yellow, these are items that we have been working on for quite some time, uh, many of them dating back to uh, the start of this back in March of 2020. Uh, green uh, is indicated by uh, ready currently as we are today, or would be uh, ready within a week of setting a date for going back to school, and I'll give an example of that uh, in a moment. Uh, the yellow uh, with the ready by March 1st uh, are things that are currently in process, uh, some of which need a date uh, to finalize that or an expected return to school um, to, to solidify some of the uh, measures we're taking as a school district. Uh, an example of ready or ready within one week is when we look at PPE under health and safety. Um, surgical face covering masks, face shields, gloves, gowns. We do have that uh, in our district at this time. For example, uh, surgical face covering masks. Uh, we have over 600,000 ready for distribution to the school sites. Uh, and when we have a firm reopening date, then we'll distribute that. So it'll take a day or two to get those to the sites well in advance of staff showing up. Uh, and that would be true for a number of these items uh, that are on site or in the district uh, that need to be delivered to a site uh, when we return back to school. Uh, other things, as I mentioned, come into play when we have that firm date and I'll let Assistant Superintendent Nazera discuss those items uh, further down the list. So and primarily the ideas around screening and testing, what I want to be clear or perhaps clarify is that, as you will recall, before we had our shelter in place, 
We had, as Robert Johns mentioned as an example, in-person assessments. We had instructional, non-instructional cohorts. As we mentioned, we have support care every day. So with those segments and that population, we have met these. In preparing for the plan for an elementary pre-K three rollout, that expands what we have to begin doing. So as an example, employees that come on campus have to have screening right now. They're taking their temperature, they're doing symptom checks. Students that come on campus are getting their symptom checks, but that's not, that doesn't mean we're ready for full uh, hybrid pre three yet. And that we will be, however, by March one. So as, as you go through some of those things around contact tracing, uh, full staffing for all programs, um, isolation room setups. We, are, we have everything in place for the size that we are currently operating under. We are within all county parameters, but to expand to the next level, then that's what we need exec kind of uh, to work up towards. So it's been helpful uh, for Dr. Kiermodar to identify for us the target and then we can put our resources and plan forward. So as an example, we are not planning to have uh, contact tracing for all high schools and middle schools and having half their population cohort come on campus on March 1. We are planning for at this point, K3 with an, pre-3 with an expansion to four, six when ready. And so some of those things that we talk about being ready further down, we have, pre, we have engagement strategies. We have a multi-tiered system of support that's ready to engage. We have re-engaging of attendance populations that we're ready to do. So many of those we are ready. As we go down to the learning continuity plan, uh, we are ready to implement models that we, some of which were previously negotiated and uh, taking feedback from teachers on those models. As Dr. Kitamura mentioned, we do have to sit down with our bargaining units and reevaluate uh, and re rework some of those models to make sure it fits the current need and parameters for the definition of pre-3 rollout. Um, you, there's uh, language about special ed populations and EL learners. So in all those plans, there's a strong uh, contingent about support for special education. And we will be moving forward with a pre through 12 special education ready on March 1. So that's greater than the pre through three. We expect to work with our special ed populations, our English learners, our newcomers, and have those populations ready for that. That's part of everyone's plan initial notice. Every element of every plan has included an example for the vulnerable populations and we'll be ready to meet that. And then as you see there for athletics, uh, um, electives and other things, including childcare, we are ready at, at this time to be able to provide those. We have been providing those and we'll roll out greater expansion of that when we talk about the pre three rollout that's coming forward. And the last thing about professional development on that, um, it, for the, for the level that we're doing now, we have professional development rolled out. We need to increase that and change that. And that'll bring us back to our bargaining units so we can prepare further for March 1 rollout. Back to you, Dr. Kinamura. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna move now back to my PowerPoint. So that's the crosswalk um, of all the different plans. So now we're gonna talk about, so how does this all come together about what it is we're gonna do in Santa Rosa? And um, Will, President Lyons said it, and I'll say it again, and I've been saying this, SRCS will be ready to open March 1st. Whether we can or not is dependent upon this virus. But I want to assure parents, teachers, community, we will be ready. Uh, we are going to continue the hard work to be ready March 1. And the moment that this virus becomes under control, if that's even a way, you know, way to put it, um, we'll open school for it. And it was KA2 under the governor's plan, but we want to do KA3. Um, KA3 is our natural class size reduction grade span. And so we're actually doing what we call pre through three, um, for our first wave. In that first wave, remember it, it does, like Steve just said, pre through 12, special education, English learners, foster youth and homeless um, are also going to be brought back to school. 
Um, and you can see my header after, after March 1st and case slash tier threshold has been met. So please, as you are talking with folks and letting them know what's happened, I, I, I don't want there to be fear that we're gonna open regardless of what's happening with COVID-19, but I also want to alleviate the fear that we won't be ready to open, okay? So, so please know that. Two weeks after, uh, we are hoping that, and, and I'm putting it in here in writing, that the goal is to open grades four through six. And I know that the secondary brought up, what about 712? The governor's plan and AB10 are silent on the secondary in-person instruction. Um, and so we will continue to work through models that are, um, have been working. We may have to make a decision. Do we do more than um, three cohorts a day? So that those are plans that we continually are thinking about with our secondary students. Crazy mouse. All right, so here's a little bit more meat and potatoes. So the um, much, much thanks to the parents and the staff at each of the high, at the elementary school, as well as Director um, Haley and Director Dillon, we have come to the conclusion with all the survey information gathered that the AABB cohort um, will be the cohort that we will go into when we return to in-person. This is our current model. Um, it has already been negotiated. And so there is no need to you know, worry about which model it is. Sorry, it is the current model that we are in. Um, and so just to remind you, I'm gonna just show, show this really quickly. This is in our return to school plan. So you will see the AA model and you will see the um, BB model, okay? It is the schedule that your kids are currently in in distance learning, but this will be the one that we, that we will um, use for in-person. Um, in, the cohorts are being developed now. Um, so your principals are gonna be reaching out to you. Um, directors Dylan and Haley are working together with your principals to get these, get these cohorts um, developed. Um, again, I do not want to um, uh, not emphasize the fact that we will begin working together with SRTA and CSCA on these MOUs. Um, as tonight, after we pass the um, Sunshine Letter, we're gonna get right on it with SRTA and CSCA. We can schedule those meetings um, anytime. Um, we have to work on staffing to, uh, to accommodate the in-person and distance learning. So what we know, you can see a couple of lines down, is it, um, it's about 35% of our um, um, students are wanting to remain in distance learning. And so our in-class sizes for KA3 are 12 per cohort because our maximum class size is 24. Remember two class size 24, two cohorts, split it in half, it's 12 and 12. But 35% of students are gonna remain in distance learning. So that means your core cohort of pre, uh, no, K A through three, is actually going to come down to about eight students, okay, in the actual in-person cohort. For uh, four through six, seven through twelve, it won't be sixteen. It's really going to come down to about eleven. So the spacing and the facilities and the classrooms are going to be much better, um, uh, uh, much better. Uh, accommodated for social distancing with these kinds of numbers. Um, one thing I wanna show you, I'm gonna go flip up. Here are the numbers, if you can see that, I'm sure you can, I hope you can. The, the, this is the breakdown of KA through three. Uh, Director Dillon and Director Haley um, have been working with the sites. Of the numbers per site for distance learning and for in-person. And so this is the kind of data that we can use to begin looking at staffing, beginning, beginning to look at cohorts, um, because we know that for childcare purposes and, and potting and all of that, you might wanna have cohorts that are um, together with certain family members or certain people. So I'll have this, this data will be up for you guys to take a look at, but it's really just the numbers of students wanting remote and wanting in person. And for planning purposes, it helps us to begin that process. Um, 
we are we have begun training with our CSEA um, staff on health and safety protocols. That's going to ramp up now to our pre through three folks, uh, so that they'll be ready with all of the health and safety protocols regarding COVID. Um, the the as I said, the CPP will be presented January twenty seventh for board approval. Um, the safety plans will be completed as soon as we receive the template. And my expectation uh, is that we will bring those forward um, with a return to school plan 3.0 on January 27th as well. Um, and I can bet you bottom dollar and Dr. Harrington is listening because he's on the next. We, we, if we don't get that the template by next week, he will go to bat for us so we get it right away. Um, we are going to apply for the February 1st funding. Um, there is the March 1st as a relief if we don't get things done, but I hope we can all work together to really get this for February 1st submission day uh, on, on board. And then the dashboard. So I'd like to show you what will go live tomorrow. Some of the dashboard is still in um, draft form and primarily this top part. Um, so we are uh, going to uh, fill in the, you see the colored legend, so that will be filled in. Um, I'm also wanting to add some uh, links to videos and pictures of the actual, you know, um, our you know amounts of PPE and and anything that can help alleviate the fear that uh, we are not ready for any of these things. And then down below, we are finally at a point where, sadly, we have enough cases that I can report. We can report um, the number of cases per site. Uh, without being able to identify anybody. And so the, the other part of the dashboard will include this, which is um, by site, the number of community-based cases and the school-based cases. Now, I want to, you to understand that school-based cases is not school transmission. It is not school transmission, okay? These are cases that show, come to us from uh, at the school site, um, but it, it, they have not been transmission, tran it has not been spread at the school, okay? So there is the, um, that data. This is real data, this is up-to-date data, and the totals are here at the bottom, okay? So um, this, is a, a, this is actually a website, uh, so it'll be a part of our website, and it will be um, live shortly. Uh, extended summer learning, yes. Uh, I have asked staff to begin working on an extended learning. Oh, uh, Assistant Superintendent Mazzara, please speak to this. This is this is great work and I'd love for you to speak to it. I'm sorry, which part? What's... I'm sorry, the dashboard. Oh, the dashboard. Well, first of all, I, I really wanna appreciate uh, our COVID coordinator, uh, Caitlin Wayhall for really putting that together and bringing that that information forward. You know, we have to report our data and we have been reporting data to public health as part of our ongoing requirements. Uh, the level of transparency and making things available, I think Dr. Kidmore, you spoke very well to it, that it is uh, important that we don't really identify individual situations. Uh, we also have been reporting to staff as part of the requirement, uh, Cal OSHA requirement, is that when we have a, a case of someone who, who was on campus that turns out later to have a, a, a positive, we notify uh, campuses as well. Um, so we send out a notice that just says that you have had someone on your campus who was, who was a positive test. That doesn't mean anyone was exposed per se. If, as an example, if a teacher working in their classroom was in their room for any part of the time and they later became positive, uh, we have to send the entire staff a notice that there was someone on campus, as an example. So that's a transparency that's been going on. And, and of course, those, those cause uh, uh, anxiety, but it's not anything that we're doing wrong. And as you mentioned, Dr. Kitamura, as of five o'clock today, there, we have not had an incident of school transmission in any of our programs, as you identified. We have over 200 students that work in our support care program and coming on campuses daily. Um, and we have not had any cases. So we are very confident in our protocols and our, our trainings that when followed, we can eliminate, if not maintain our, our no school transmission. Thank you for that. Um, so extended learning, I've asked staff um, led by Dr. Guzman um, for extended summer learning to begin the week after school gets out and continue until the week before school starts. 
So much more, um, much longer uh, time frame, And so you'll be hearing more about that. Um, I think it's extremely important for us to it, get in there and get as much um, learning as possible, accelerated learning, targeted learning um, during these summer months, and that you should plan for the following summer the same thing. So that people, so that plan accordingly. That you know, the following summer after that, we have this chunk of time with our kids before this coming school year and after next school year, so we can really, really address any kind of learning loss. Crazy mouse. Um, so that was that. And so finally, the priorities for March first readiness. Um, I'm meeting with parents as well. I've, I've asked for a representative from each of the school sites to meet with me on January 21st. Uh, you should have gotten your email um, and it is going to be at five o'clock. Uh, and so uh, I look forward to going over the plans, the documents, the things that we're gonna be submitting, hearing your questions and providing feedback. Um, we're going to continue to work on surveillance testing with the county and determining what vendor we will use um, the, um, yeah, and then uh, a priority is to work together with the SRTA and CSCA uh, on revisiting the MOUs, uh, continuing to feed the SRCS dashboard um, with information that will be helpful to all of you uh, in easing any um, anxiety you have, uh, providing um, information to ask us questions, um, whatever these, this information can do to help us move forward. Uh, finally, the COVID vaccinations. Um, Dr. Harrington has actually hired a retired superintendent to oversee uh, this huge process of getting our thousands of educators vaccinated. And so uh, I have a meeting tomorrow with Dr. Harding, uh, who is leading this, this charge uh, to help problem solve the way in which we are going to get staff vaccinated as quickly as possible. So with that, I know it was a lot of information. I thank you for the extra time uh, to be able to give this report. Um, I, it will be up on the website so you can access it again with the links. Um, and please use that question at srcs.ca.k12 if you have any questions. And many of you have my email already. And so feel free to email me um, if you have, an, have a question as well. President Fong, I turn it back to you and thank you for the extended time. Dr. Kitamura, I really appreciate, the board appreciates um, the care, the detail that all of you have put into this. Um, I think anxiety comes from uh, not knowing. And so having this available to us and, and to the public uh, on the dashboard and on the website is a great thing. And yes, all of that was quite important. So thank you so much. That was a lot and I, I'm so in awe of all the work that has been done. It's complex, we've said that. All right, um, so we're going to take a bio break and it's gonna be, we will be back in 10 minutes at 8.22. See everybody soon and we will start with uh, our e discussion and action items. Do we have our superintendent? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> All right. Okay, great. Welcome back, everyone. We're moving on to um, discussion action items. We are in E1. This is an action item. It's the resolution for Santa Rosa City Schools feasibility study for district consolidation, something that we've been asking for for a while. So thank you so much. And I understand that Dr. Harrington is here with us tonight. Yes, he is. I'm so appreciative of Dr. Harrington coming up, um, on tonight to talk with you, present to you information about a feasibility study for consolidation. And so as you can see, Dr. Harrington's being, Dr. Harrington's being brought over. And there he is. Thank you, Dr. Harrington, for being here tonight. Um, I believe um, 
Beth Burke is going to uh, run your slides, and so we're going to share the slides. Um, and so I turn it over to Dr. Harrington. Thank you, Diane. I appreciate it. Um, I was asked to break a presentation on what the feasibility study for unification is. Um, and we're going to learn terms because consolidation is different than, fees than unification. So it's just important that we all understand that. If you look at the names of districts, it tells you what they were. For example, Santa Rosa City Schools is one of five statewide city school system. They are one dis districts shared by one common board, two separate districts under one board's supervision. In Santa Cruz, where I was superintendent, Santa, Santa Cruz City Schools is a city schools. It has one board over two districts. If you look at a unified school district, it's a K-12 district. If you look at a union school district, which you see Bellevue Union, Bennett Valley Union, those were, the, those were consolidations of the one room schoolhouses in that area. And, um, and when you look at Santa Rosa City Schools, it's, the elementary district was a unification of a lot of single one room schoolhouses. Monroe was one of the school districts that existed at the time. And then you look at joint union school districts or joint unified school districts. And those are districts that cross county lines. So the name of a school district reflects on how it was formed and created. And one of this feasibility study is looking at, currently uh, we have a request for proposals uh, being finalized by the county committee. But I'm gonna, if Beth, if you would go on, you can go past my name and go to the purpose. Thanks. Um, we're gonna talk about what is district unification and what is the role of the county office, in this case, the county superintendent and then the county committee on school district organization has a role to play as well. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about West Sonoma County's requests because your requests may be very similar. And then what are the key considerations of the study that you would like to have conducted? That's important as well. And then I'll answer any gen general questions. So if you go to the next slide, Beth, there are three forms of reorganization of a district. A unification is an elementary and high school district or portions thereof of elementary districts and high school districts coming together to offer a K-12 program, a community program that serves students K through 12, which you currently do as a city school, um, but you would be bringing in other districts with you. Um, unifications were one where there's a unification where you can have one or more feeder elementary districts feeding into a unified districts. For example, Healdsburg Unified, uh, it used to be Healdsburg Union High School District. Windsor broke off of that district and became its own unified school district. And Healdsburg st stood alone, and so they became a unified district. Uh, but it still has some feeder districts. For example, Alexander Valley is a K-6 uh, district, or K, excuse me, it's a K-8 district that feeds into Healdsburg. And then you have West Side School District, which feeds into Healdsburg Unified. Those students are served by Healdsburg Unified for high school, but they are still standalone elementary districts. So it's a, it's a blended model and it all depends on what the community vote turns out to be as it's set by the county committee. And then there's a consolidation of two or more like districts, two, uni, two elementary districts forming together or two K-8 districts forming together. And that's a consolidation and those are usually called union school districts where two elementaries join together. This particular study that is being done or being requested uh, that we're currently doing is for a unification and it's a feasibility study of unification. And um, Jeff, uh, if Beth, if you could go to the next slide, thank you. So why consider it? Well, one reason to consider it is it eliminates redundancy or duplicate services. You have duplicate administrative services, duplicated pupil personnel services, and duplicated library services, and du you know a lot of duplicated services. So it's it's and then it creates an economy of scale to provide better service through an economy of scale. Um, it can also provide more options to students. Now, many of the reason districts are looking at this is because we are a declining enrollment county in the state of California. Of the fifty-eight counties. This county ranks number three in declining enrollment in the whole state of California. 
And the reason for that, most of you know, is the multiple fires, the evacuations that we have had to go through. But we have, have an accelerating decline. We come right in after Alpine County is first. It's a little single rural county up, in the, up by Lake Tahoe. And when you only have 200 students in the whole county and you lose a few students, you have a pretty high percentage. Right after Alpine County is Los Angeles Unified. And number three is Sonoma County, which is almost 6% of our student population is declining. So when we're looking at unification, the feasibility is looking at what's practical with declining enrollment, what's practical and what's operational. Many of the, if you look at California history, many of the union school districts were formed when the one room schoolhouses couldn't sustain themselves. When you looked in the 1960s, the rapid period of growth the state offered incentive money to unify. And in Southern California, that was accelerated uh, because of the incentive money. It did not take off at the North because of the fact that people wanted local control. So you had two different uh, thoughts. Um, and there's a general physical savings by this economy of scale. And you achieve a, co a coordinated aligned curriculum. That was a big thing. When you have nine feeder districts, all of which could be in different frameworks or case or courses of study. You, you could have a, a, a math program coming out of one district. You could end up with nine different math programs coming into your high school district. It makes it very challenging when you don't have an articulated curriculum. Um, I do know you work cooperatively with your elementary districts. Maybe that you don't have that, but these are some of the things that are looked at. And it creates a more and a cohesive sense of community. And what is a community that that better serves its students. So that's one of some of the reasons for consideration that districts have had. Beth, if you could go to the next slide. Uh, the Sonoma County Committee on School District Organization has a part to play. You've worked with them before when they did the trustee areas. Their, their job and responsibility is to look at the practicality of the, of the proposal that comes before them. They don't create the proposal that comes before them. They look at the practicality of the proposal that comes before them as it relates to certain state measurements and criteria. Now, this particular study is being requested of the county superintendent, and that is because as the county superintendent, I can do a more comprehensive study than the county committee can. They have 60 days in which to make an overview assessment of the situation should they get a petition. That's not the type of study that is as comprehensive as the one that we're going to do for West Sonoma County Union High School District. The length of the study can then be anywhere from 12 months to, to 18 months, uh, depending on how comprehensive the study is and depending on what the key questions are that are being asked in the study. I will share with you some of the key questions that are being asked in the other district study. But they want to, uh, they want to, they want to be empowered to create or abolish and arrange trustee areas. That's what the county committee does. It increases or decreases the number of governing boards. They have that authority. They determine alternative methods of electing governing board members. They have that authority. They establish and abolish common governing boards. They have that authority. And they rearrange trustee areas based on federal decennial census, which will be coming up shortly. They place consolidation and unification votes before the public and they determine the eligible voters or the voting process for that ballot. So they have those authorities. Now what you do is you have, uh, we have about 10 representatives. We have an elementary and a secondary representative for each of the supervisorial areas. And you normally pick somebody on your board to uh, be on the county committee for school district organization. And what they do is they ratify the representative for your trustee area. I believe your current uh, sitting member is uh, former trustee, uh, Pugh, Frank Pugh is on the board on the County Committee for School District Consolidation, or excuse me, on the <laughs> County Committee on School uh, Organization. What's the role of the County Superintendent in this study? Beth, you wanna to go to the next slide? Um, SCO provides the staff support to the County Committee. They, I underwrite their operating budget. I underwrite the operating staff that supports them. Um, if they get a request for consolidation, unification, <clears throat> or transfer of a territory, which is made in the study, um, I have to underwrite that. 
should it come through. And I do, I finance the study. West Sonoma County Union High School District has requested a feasibility study of unification within its territory boundaries, which is what your study would do. It would look within the territory boundaries of your high school district and which of those districts would it be feasible to unify uh, on, these, on these practical matters? Uh, it may not be practical, for example, to if you put uh, Santa Rosa City Elementary and Roseland Elementary and Bellevue Elementary, you might have a higher supplemental grant concentration fund and you might have a higher uh, Besides the supplemental, you probably have, you have concentration money that goes there. Those students have a higher free and reduced lunch count that produces, gener produces greater funds for you. But if you add in to that unification, um, Rincon Valley, that might dilute your funding bottle. So when you look at the study, you wanna see who the right players are for what you wanna do. Uh, and it might be pragmatic and practical for you to have a district that's maybe the core of the city and you do the, some of the suburban areas or the suburb areas as standalone districts that feed into you. And then again, it could be that it's best in your best interest to have the, all the districts feed in because it doesn't get diluted. So you have to look at the practicality of the funding models. Um, if you look at West Sonoma County Union's high school district, their particular request is they wish to see the practicality of a unified school district with, it, with its feeder districts. They wanna look at the practicality of a unified district um, within the Annaly attendance area. And they wanna look at the practicality of a unified district with the, um, can't, can't think of, uh, Ca, is it, no, it's not Casa. I think it may be Casa. El Molino. High school. What is it? El, El Molino. El, Elmo. Yeah, they'd like to see the practicality around Elmo. And then there's gonna be a cohort. And most of you, if you know what a cohort is, you look at the kindergarten and you track them across to the 12th grade. If you have a declining enrollment in this county, it may be pragmatic to do it right now, but five years down with declining enrollment, it may not be sustainable. And you're back in the same situation you are. When you do a three-year study of your own operating budget, you've had to cut millions of dollars out of your budget because of declining enrollment and increased operating costs. So you have to look at those things. But they're looking at those three, uh, those three questions and their feasibility study besides asking the questions about educational program. But um, you might wanna configure your study around your high schools in your high school attendance areas. So that's how they're doing their study and their request. An individual property a request may be initiated for unification by individual property owners. They wish to transfer their property from one district to another. That's by petition, they can do that. You can do the registered voters in the reorganized area. 10% of the voters in that area submit a petition and it goes to the county committee and the study begins. They circumvent the local board. They do it on their own. The school district governing boards in the affected territory can do it by resolution, conduct the study. The resolution approved by the majority of the members of any city council, any county board of supervisors, any governing board members of any special district within your territory can request, a, a re, make the request for, to form a, a study of the area. Now this has not happened. The board of supervisors usually don't wanna get involved in this. So they have never taken a position. I don't know about the city council if they have a position on it or not. But, anyone could initiate a study besides yourselves. So the county committee is empowered to initiate any form of reorganization that comes before it. The public has the right to bring it in a, in a variety of manners. And I'm identifying the types of, of initiations that you can see here. Beth, the next slide. Um, once again, if it goes to the county committee, they have 60 days in which to act on it. The county committee has to convene a public hearing, study of the proposal. They submit recommendations to the State Board of Education, uh, which looks at the study to make sure there's equity and it's been addressed. 
The state board may also hold public hearings before approving it or disapproving the petition or by consent, they can just approve it by consent and they can waive an election or they can set an election for the community. If it's a unification, the more than likely they would approve a, a unification vote and, the, and they would uh, see if the boundaries or the parameters set by the county committee are equitable for that unification vote. For example, do they vote within their own school district? And does it have to take a majority of the local or is it a majority of the whole? That's all determined by the county committee. If the whole is voted on, uh, you know, the, the result might be different. Once again, the community who has no children and over, remember, we only, the, the population of the county is the majority of parents, or they are, are no longer parents, but the majority of the voters are non-parents in, in your district. So those people would have a voice in this decision as well. If approved, the county superintendent calls for an election for the proposed reorganization and for the concurrent election of a governing board. So when you put before the, the public the proposal of a unified district, you concurrently submit the names of that new board. Should that petition for approval be voted on and accepted by the county committee, I mean, excuse me, by the voters, the board has to be accepted by the voters at the same time. Once approved by the election, you have now two boards existing, the old Santa Rosa City Schools Board and the new Unified School Board, of which some of you could run for the new board and you'd resign your old seat. The idea being the new school district begins the process of reorganization, establishing a salary schedule, adopting policies, and they have a year in which to do all that work. While the old board pre-exists, and as board members' terms expire, whatever the last majority of the board terms expire, that district fades away, and the new board comes in place and replaces it. So that's part of the reorganization process. When you look at this uh, next slide, Beth, when you look at West Sonoma County High School District's request, they want, a, they want a comprehensive written report to be submitted to the county superintendent and in support of an oral presentation to be made to the county committee, they want it to report shall provide a written analysis of options, alternatives, and the feasibility of implementing such options and alternatives. And they wanna prepare an executive summary outlining the opportunities and challenges at the local level. Next slide, Beth. In their feasibility study, is it feasible to have West Sonoma County Union High School District, which is the longest title of any school in the state of California, just a side note there, unify with one or more of its elementary school districts to become a new K-12 school district? Is it feasible to have the West Sonoma County Union High School District unify with one or more of its elementary school districts configured around Annalee High School attendance area to become a new K-12 school district? Is it feasible to have the West Sonoma County Union High School District unify with one or more of its elementary school districts configured around the El Molino High School attendance area to become the new Windsor, I'm sorry, to become the new West Sonoma County Union High School District K-12 school district, such as the Russian River Valley Unified School District? What other scenarios or configurations are feasible that have not been specifically asked for? That was the one last question, because maybe the study will will show a different configuration. So this study and the cost of this study is borne by me. And uh, if you could go to the next question, which is on uh, Beth business operations. These are the key questions that are gonna be looked at. Eligibility of benefits, the pros and cons related to state supplemental and concentration funds per district versus per pupil unified configuration. We know what it is currently. What is it going to be if it's unified? What do the CTE education funds look like in a unified can reconfigured school district? What do the seven, eight grade supplemental funds? Is there a gain or a loss in a can reunified configured school district? What's the total dollar value per pupil in a unified versus a district model? What's the tax obligation and the conversion of that tax obligation on the new district? versus the individual district voter approved parcel taxes and facility bond obligations. And so you have to look at that. Who does that get shifted to? 
if the voter approved parcel tax is within the boundaries of the high school district, which it is in this case, then it's shared by everyone. But if it was, you don't know if uh, Rincon Valley may have a parcel tax. So how do you manage that parcel tax and what's the obligation for the parcel tax that those voters approve? Can it be spread across uh, a greater, can the dollars from that approval be used across the district? Those things have to all be looked at. Then what's the status of the bond oversight committees? There's multiple bond oversight committees that have to be looked at that exist. What's the status of deferred maintenance obligations per district? Your facilities could be at excellent standing and another district could have buildings that are need a lot of attention. What's the debt and liability obligations each district has? How do you share that debt? How does that debt get absorbed? What are the charter school impacts on the unified school district and its tax rolls? If you uh, know how the, the tax rolls are handled, charters, you may end up with a lot of charters and all that money gets siphoned off because charters are paid off the tax rolls first and the state comes back in and backfills it. So it depends how many pre-existing charters there are within this new situation. For example, many of the elementaries that you feed into you have charter seventh and eighth grade programs. Those could be dissolved in a unified school district because you're now operating a K-12 school system of which you can reconfigure the schools to be K-8. You don't need to have a charter supplement. So there's options there for the districts. Transfer of property and equipment and ownership of transfer of property and equipment has to be looked at. Uh, transportation funding versus district funding. How's that gonna work? Who's the new authorizer of charters? And what's the five-year declining enrollment projection for all districts within this study? Which that piece of information is just vital to know anyway. So the next slide, Beth. The general education program is part of this study. The study cited, is there an academic continuum utilizing state assessments that increases when you have a unified school district? What's the federal entitlement program per district and the unified Title I, Title II, Title III? How do you, you go, how do you deal with your local control accountability plan benefits of a unified district? Right now you have nine or nine or ten pre-existing LCAPs. You go to one. The site, the research studies as they would want it, the research studies cited as it relates to the educational benefits for a K-12 unified versus multiple feeder districts and special education costs. This is a big one. The projected impact of a deficit unified versus the individual district. Do you reduce your deficit impact or encroachment in a unified district versus what you had in, in a in standalone district? What are the service capabilities of, in special ed? Uh, you, you probably could become your own standing consortium within your own uh, unified district. You'd be large enough to do that. And how would membership in a special education consortium be impacted? They, they run in uh, West Sonoma County runs a special ed consortium and uh, they, they find it a beneficial cost to do that. So those things have to be looked at in any study that goes forward. And so someone says, well, now you start to understand why it takes 16 months to put this together. There are a lot of questions that have to be answered. And then let's go to the human resources questions that have to be answered. Thank you, Beth. You have to look at salary and benefit adjustments per unification configuration. The law says that it should be within the average of the districts. So you look at the districts being configured and you, the schedule has to be built within that average. Um, it doesn't go necessarily to the highest step, which is what it used to do, or to the highest schedule. So now it's an average of the schedules brought together. Some districts would benefit, some districts may lose, some teachers may lose on that situation. And the contract process steps within a new unified a new association is formed, a new bargaining unit is formed, just like a new board is formed, a new bargaining unit is formed, an affiliation has to be decided, or my AFT or CTA, then that has to be decided. So there's a lot of process steps in this. Employment status, teachers take their date of hire with them in the unified school district, if they're hired by the unified school district. So there's a hiring process. 
It's not like a program transfer process uh, where the teachers are being absorbed by a district that's taking a program transfer. Administrative, uh, administrative staffing ratio. The state, there's a state code, if anyone ever wanted to look at it, that sets the staffing ratio of teachers to administrators. Um, for a unified school district, it's a little larger uh, staffing ratio, but I think you currently have one of the larger staffing ratios per administrators in the county um, with your staff. But you look at that to see that you're not overstaffed with administrators under the new ratios. Maintenance and conditions of collective bargaining agreements until unit, unified takes over. How do you maintain all the contract negotiations with the outgoing district and how do you maintain the contract negotiations with the incoming district? Credential and issues. When you unify, you could be overstaffed with multiple subject credential teachers. Well, the new district would then hire teachers and if they don't need, if they only need 10 teachers and there's 12 eligible teachers, they pick the 10 that they want. So it doesn't mean everyone gets absorbed. And I think that's a misnomer oftentimes. And retiree health benefit obligations. Each district has its own obligations as it relates to health benefits and retiree benefits. How does that get absorbed? And how is that paid off by the new district? So is that obligation on the new district when the district gets consolidated or unified? Can I look at the next slide, Beth? Then of course, the, has to look at the demographics and the study, the government structure per the California Voting Rights Act. What would the new trustee areas look like? It has to be socioeconomically diverse, has to have diverse, There's a, of, the whole pro, of the whole unified district. The geographical compactness, the equality and resource distribution within the new district, a sequel review has to be completed, which is normally just a check off. And you might want a, comp a Thompson configuration, which I shared. That's what they call, Mike Thompson was the state senator who set up that configuration where a unified district could serve two standalone elementaries if they wanted to sign a, a compact agreement for service. So those things have to be looked at. And um, I think the next slide is potential next steps. First of all, once the study is done, you accept and review the study. You can choose to do nothing. The study's been complete. You have a lot of resources there. Or the boards that are impacted may say, we don't want anything to do with it. Or they may say, you know, three of us want this. And so they just takes one board to initiate the, the county committee to insert itself. So the county committee only comes in when they have a request to come in. Uh, all collective bargaining associations could forward the study to the county committee and the county committee would come in. The board of supervisors, as I said, could forward it to the county committee. The city council, since you're within the jurisdiction of the city council, could forward it to the county committee. The county committee of district organization comes in when the study has been forwarded to them with an endorsement. So the endorsement is the key. You could end up with nobody endorsing the study, but you might have 10% of the electorate who signed a petition to endorse the study. And so that could initiate it. So any of the following entities, that could, this can happen now, the 10% voter response could happen now. The Board of Supervisors can make the request other than the, rather than the school district. Any of the following entities could choose to initiate a consolidation following a, a study. And that's what I just went over. Those are all the affected people that can make, request the study be initiated. So um, we're going to distribute the study in the first block to all those people. And then in the second block, all those people have authority to make the request to the county committee. Uh, next slide, Beth. I said a lot of information in a very short time. So I know there's a lot to digest here, but um, it's a there, there has been no district under L, under since 2013 in the state of California uh, that has consolidated, uh, excuse me, has unified under the new state funding model. So we are breaking ground with this study uh, at a statewide level, only because never no one has ever considered it. 
And once again, you may be in the same situation with declining enrollment to, to go to the voters and say, we have to look at the most practical way to exist going forward. I don't know what, what, where you are financially with that, but you need to look at that. Will it be better for us going forward? So I can answer any questions. Dr. Harrington, thank you so much for that comprehensive report. That is a daunting, daunting task. Um, board, this is an action item and we will take questions now to Dr. Harrington or to our staff. I see Omar Medina and right now that's who I see. Oh, Ed Sheffield. So uh, Dr. Harrington, thank you for that presentation. It was uh, a lot of detailed info. Um, a couple of the questions that I have um, is first, in terms of the, um, let's say after the study, and let's say that we push, ask for the study to be considered for a vote, do, does, it, let's say that uh, we're looking at all districts in Santa Rosa, does every single district have to like uh, opt in by that 25%? Well, those districts do not have to, when you ask for the study and the study is completed and you choose to forward it to the county committee, then the county committee has to go back out to the, re the dis respective districts impacted and conduct hearings in those districts. That's what they had to do when you went to the trustee areas. So there's an obligation to take it back. And they may get community response that's adversarial to the study from those perspectives. And they may choose to say there's not enough votes here or, or the, the request may be, your request may be a unified district that excludes some districts and leave some districts as a consolidated center or core. So it depends, and, but and, they don't have to, uh, the districts don't have to sign on, but they do have a vote on the unification if it's transfer of territory. Because if you decide to unify and Bennett Valley doesn't wanna be part of the unification, that will be reflected to the county committee and the county committee decide does Bennett Valley vote within its own territorial area or is it part of a whole vote? I can't say with the county committee, but they have the authority to set that jurisdiction. Is it a vote of the whole or a vote of the, by sections? And I guess that was my next question. If it is a vote of the whole that the committee does, then regard it, ultimately it'll be whatever that entire vote for that. Right, item when the is. whole community has had a vote. And if they set it to be of the whole, then that's the, the county committee has that jurisdiction. Then when it goes to the state board, Bennett Valley would have another objection. They could take it to the state board. And, and I think in listening to your presentation, I don't know, it, it seems like almost fairly obvious to me, but it seems like you also hinted at, like there's a lot of potential for more efficient use of uh, funds given the, the, the fact that we're losing so many students. Does that sound like kind of what you're alluding to? That ultimately- well, I'm just saying that you have a, a large declining enrollment in greater mass than you've, you've been doing teacher layoffs. So the situation is through a, consolid, a unification study, you may be able to shift teachers around so that you reduce layoffs, but you have a better, but you, once again, those teachers are get absorbed by the new district, whatever the new salary schedule is. So that all has to be configured out, but, um, there's no guarantee that every teacher will get picked up either. And in terms of the study, you know, one of my concerns and, and one of the reasons that I'm really supportive of this is around um, overall issues of equity, just given how things have changed in our community over time. But that's not something that the study necessarily looks at, right? It does look at demographics. And it, according, to the, according to one of the rules for the county committee is that it must look at equity, equity within, the, within the new configured district. I mean, if you can't make a district, if you were configuring a new district, they would want balance, as much balance as your demographics would allow. You can't make it disproportionately all one configured student population or ethnic group. And, and the final question, um, I believe you indicated that in when it would go to, um, if it were sent to, for the people to vote, um, trustee areas would be predefined. Well, the new district, the trust, new trustee areas would be established. Uh, people could, I, I, you could, uh, any one of the board members, even like a, a, one of the elementary board members could run for one of the seats, not knowing, you know, 
So it could be that they're running for a seat. I'm just going to say an area, let's say it's Bellevue and there's a seat designation in that area. That person should run for that seat. If it's approved, they are seated with the new board. And that often happens. I think Diane probably could speak to that better than I, because she was in the Grant Union High School District and they had a unified study. That was the last major unification study. And it, for 10 years, they had argued about doing it. And finally, I think through grand jury report and the, and the assemblyman or state senator, uh, Steinberg pushed it through because, the, because of the politics within the community of the different entities, uh, the community at large voted it in. Um, and I'll let her speak to that history, but you have, it's a very long pro, the study was done almost 10 years before the voters got to vote on it because of all of the internal politics that went on. Well, that was all the questions I had at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Director Sheffield. Uh, thank you, Dr. Harrington, uh, for the presentation. Um, you mentioned in this study uh, that this study could be um, 16 months of process. Um, and if we were to adopt a resolution for the feasibility study, could there be an independent community member led signature gathering campaign right now um, or anytime during the feasibility study process um, or before it's complete? It can't happen. I mean, I'm, I've been yeah. dealing with that issue right now as it relates to this study, as it relates to the, the, the district is looking at consolidation of its high schools in West Sonoma County. So the, the, the citizens group uh, was thinking of doing a petition of, of getting the 10% petition. Uh, through discussion, I said, well, what are you petitioning? You wanna do a, a unified school district? You don't even know if it's feasible. Right. Said, let me finish the study and then you have something to which to draw your petition to. It makes sense if you're gonna do a petition. If the study substantiates your question, that's what the voters need to see. Now, in the sake of trying to save time, is it possible for the uh, feasibility study to come out in segments or is it a complete study? At it's a, uh, we're pushing for a complete study. If you, you would be an addendum to the request, the, the feasibility study. I mean, I've got the primary questions are the same for both districts, majority wise. It's your key questions of, do you want to configure exactly. around your high schools or do you want to configure it around uh, the whole attendance area of the high school and what might, it, what might the configuration models look like? Right. I would sit down with, with the board president and the superintendent and say, what are your key questions you want in the study? because I will address those key questions. You don't necessarily have the same issues that West Sonoma County does around their two high schools uh, sort of territorially, but you may have a situation where you have some key questions that you wanna ask your, your community that you wanna make sure that the community gets addressed. Uh, the reason those questions are in there is because the citizens have spoken up um, to the county committee and the county committee uh, ask them what those questions were in the county committee, since it's also helping me. They they won't, we, the, the decision was made that it would be a study that's fully comprehensive to both the county committee and the county superintendent. Because the county committee didn't want to uh, do another study mm -hmm. based on the initial study. So it's collaborative. We're doing one study at a cost of over $125,000 at the most, at, at the least, and 200,000 at the most. If, if the two dist if the Santa Rosa study is in there and the West Sonoma County High School District studies in there, they yeah. will, I bet I'm just doing a request for proposals. You'll be two separate documents, but I will have one vendor doing it. Sure. Okay, thank you. Other questions by board members? Um, Vice President Jill McCormick. Thank you again, Dr. Harrington, for um, coming tonight and laying out this process and um, getting us familiar with it. Um, just two quick questions. Um, why, in your opinion, why has no one in the state attempted this 
since they've changed the funding formula? Um, the reason I believe it is because the, of the, the funding model was supposed to equalize the funding for districts and it did in somewhat, but then of course it didn't keep up with the cost of living adjustments as it goes along. So it just, the spread starts to move. And uh, so that's one of the reasons. Also, we had to remember 2013, it's only been seven years uh, since the, the restructuring of the finance model. So uh, it's, it's relatively early in the process. The last school district that was a city schools, just to let you know, Santa Barbara city schools became Santa Barbara unified. And the reason they ran as a city school district, if you don't know Santa Barbara, it's a basic aid school district and the basic aid elementary exceeded the state average as well as the basic aid high school district exceeded the state average. But when it went to LCFF, they're saying, why are we having two standalones? We have to do everything in duplicates. Mm -hmm. So they decided we get to be one unified school district with one large basic aid revenue number. We, they also have declining revenue. And I'm sure Rick will tell you as the population growth decreases and the value of your property increases, the amount per student is greater. Mm -hmm. Now you're not a basic aid district, but uh, they decided that they would just before 2000, right after the LCFF went in, they re, they didn't have to do a big study because they were already one operational board. And so they just voted themselves in as a unified district, as a community, because they'd already had one common board and they had one common set of trustee areas. Okay, thank you, thank you. That helps a little bit. And then um, my next question is, as far as um, the study, if we uh, vote to move forward um, and request this study, um, during the actual study, is the burden more on SCO or is it on our staff? Uh, the burden is shared somewhat because we have to interview the, your staff or we need, we have most of your data in our database system. We have most of the information on the finances within the system, but there would be some interviewing of staff as it relates to services. For example, your special ed department would be surveyed to see what's duplicated services you're paying for, what type of, you know, Steve would be interviewed as it relates to that and, and whether or not you can even become your own SELPA because you'd be large enough at that point. But then you can't leave the pre-existing SELPA understaffed. So you have to look at both of those things. Okay. And um, my last question is, um, so you use the Grant Union High School as an example of being like almost 10 years in this process. Um, as far as completing the study goes, um, what would you say would be realistically the quickest you think that could happen? And, you know, and a, just an estimate of of how long we're talking as far as, um, you know, the study. Somewhere around 2022, 23, okay. 2000, 2022, 23. Okay. And so once again, once a minute, all you're requesting is a study. You're right. not forcing anyone to do anything other than looking at the practicality of what this might look like. What it will become is the community will use it if it is beneficial and not, and not acted on then you might see some action from community. Okay. That's what happened in Grant and uh, the, the feeder districts, um, Rio Linda and some of the feeder districts, people said, it. look, it, it validates us being together. And, and of course there were issues within, uh, I don't know if it was as tumultuous when I was there in Sacramento area, but Grant had it, its ups and downs with some really bad uh, boards and superintendents. So they, the community is sort of, sort of rebelled. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Okay. I see uh, Director De La Cruz. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Harrington, for your presentation. I feel like I'm still digesting so much of this deep information. Um, I would really love to hear kind of what happened after Grant Union consolidated and I'll leave that to Diane 
She has yeah. maybe some of the battle scars from that. I don't know. Diane? And just kind of hearing okay. pros and cons and, and what, what it felt like after um, the process. And if there's a way that we can reverse engineer this to learn from. Well, also remember now, Grant is no longer exist. It's the Twin Rivers Union Unified School District. <laughs> That's what they did. That's what, it's where the American River and the uh, Sacramento River merge. So that's right. how it got its name, Twin Rivers. Diane. Yeah, but I'll never give up my Grant uh, tchotchkes and my Grant sweatshirt. And I'm a pacer for life, right, uh, Anna Trunell? So actually, Anna would be a better person because she stayed on in the district. I jumped ship. Uh, when, the, when the consolidation began to happen uh, and I could see where uh, to be, you know, full, fully uh, uh, transparent, where our multi, what they called multicultural education was going at the secondary level, basically being kind of like dissolved. I, and I was at that director level at that time. Um, I, I didn't want, that was not gonna fly with me. So I left. So Anna though, you stayed on, right? And uh, there were lots of issues I know with the unions consolidating and departments consolidating and, yeah, so do you want to describe kind of what happened after Rick and I <laughs> bailed? <laughs> so when, I, and I was a part of the Grant District, uh, when we- um, You all left the area. Yeah, the three of us were. <laughs> <laughs> um, and came here. <laughs> right. Wow. Um, so, so imagine um, four unique districts that come together uh, and you imagine it like a family where you have to uh, grow new relationships, you have to build and forge new understandings with each other. Um, Grant District was the secondary, the only secondary district of the four districts that came together. So there were three elementaries that came together with the one secondary. And there was a lot of posturing um, amongst the, the groups. Um, I, I was hired as one of their first secondary directors of, of uh, ed services. And so there, you know, there was a lot of posturing on the part of multiple management groups who came together as one at the district office um, to share their understanding or their lack thereof. Over time, um, there was a reimagining um, and several cycles of uh, understanding around what management is, um, how to serve uh, elementary population um, from a secondary lens. Um, the benefit truly was how we think about the matriculation of students in an education system that has that builds a con a, con, a continuity of a learning pathway, and that took a lot of time for individuals to understand each other's culture, uh, for elementary to secondary and vice versa, and then also to think about growing a larger community sense. So that took time and imagination as well. It also burnt a lot of bridges. Uh, in some regard. And, you know, obviously the district still stands and internally they continue with some struggles, um, which is, I think, just lends itself to the area of which I absolutely keep a piece of my heart uh, for yeah. the community there. So yeah. thank you. Yeah. So it's not easy. <laughs> And I mean, I, I guess my, my follow-up question to that is, you know, I, I hear definitely that there is a, you know, a, the, the difficult work of consolidating cultures um, of different districts. And, um, you know, I, I guess, maybe I'll phrase my question, like what kind of bubbled to the top? Was it the best of it? Was it the worst of it? Is it a combination? Um, and then, you know, and, and how, what kind of, what kind of leadership is really required to, to, you know, um, to kind of pull out the best practices of, 
of consolidation of cultures. And then my second question, which is kind of part of this is that I feel like, you know, this kind of goes to, I think Diane, something that you mentioned when you were talking about this is, you know, the messing around with that kind of multicultural education. I feel like we're on such a strong path with ethnic studies and with some of our crush philosophy, you know, the crush training and, um, and I wonder, and maybe this is a question for a combination of Diane and Dr. Harrington, um, you know, how, how does um, kind of substantive best, how do substantive best practices go into the study as, you know, kind of benchmarks or goals for us to hit? Is that something that we're looking at not only kind of aligning curriculum paths, but also kind of really, really making sure that we pick the best of all of us? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if the study will identify all the sub programs that you have versus the other element of the elementary districts, but what you might want to do is would look at what is a common theme between all the districts that you have as it relates to diversity and equity to see if those are pre existing. Um, I know that, for example, Bellevue has some of the same value system that you do as it relates to those things. Um, and then look at building capacity of those items. Uh, but that would be the burden of the new board because they would need to develop its new vision, mission, and, and values and tenets. And one of the things that uh, I know the grant didn't do that a new superintendent should do is build the values and tenets of the organization. Because if those are not defined, then people pre exist in old habits. And so as a district superintendent, that's one of the things I know that I have done and I know Diane has done. You need to find a leader who would build the values and tenets built from consensus of the board. How do you wanna see your administrators behave? How you wanna see your teachers behave? And if we hire you into the system, these are the values and tenets of the U whatever the new unified school district is called. Um, and, and that's what you start there and you, use that year and a half to do some capacity building with the staff you start to hire. I don't know if that occurred, Anna, and I don't know if that occurred, Diane, but that's those are some of the prerequisites for building yeah. a new school district. Those things need to be the initial steps because you're building a no, totally new culture and you want it to be a new culture, but you want it to be a collaborative culture. If you let everybody just drop back to their old habits, that's part of the problem I think they had at the beginning is they slipped into, well, this is what we always do and this is the way right. we always do it. Right. right. And it wasn't clearly articulated, at least I felt from what I've read. Yeah, and, and it really became kind of a gauntlet of having a job, not having a job or who, how many from this district were gonna be in this department and who was gonna out power someone out. I do remember all of that. Um, and I, like, like um, uh, Anna has said, I think um, a new superintendent came in and I think really helped stabilize things uh, after the superintendent was there when they consolidated. So you're right, uh, Dr. De La Cruz, it really is going to need to be a leader who understands and knows how to bring diverse groups together for a common cause, for the common good, the, the central good of what it is we need to do. So yeah, and that's gonna be incumbent on the board. That, that's really gotta be the leadership of all of you um, to very, be very steadfast and strong about what your expectations are. And it, your uh, mission and vision, our mission and vision is just such a powerful document to build from that the new board, whatever, if this new board comes about should do exactly the same thing should have that as the building blocks for what the expectation is for the new district. And look at the and look at the districts you're bringing in, what their vision and mission statements were and see how many of those you can align with yours, or the, or the, or the new board can align. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Are there any other board members who have questions? I have a question and I'm a little, I'm missing a piece here. How did the grant for what finally became Twin Rivers, how did they move from asking for a feasibility study to legislative action? 
Um, they didn't ask for a feasibility study. What they did is they just went into the full study by petition. The voters brought it on them. So they were basically forced. Well, they had a grand jury report that talked about stuff about it. First was a grand jury report that said the districts were dysfunctional as they were independent in units. And then the citizens committee, because it's a lot, if you ever go through highway 80 and you're going out past Highway 80, the, as it goes towards Lake uh, Reno, that whole community was, if you go see, that's where Sacramento's building all its new houses. And there were new residents coming in, and there was a high dissatisfaction rate with the delivery service model they were having. And so when the grand jury report came out and the uh, new, new electorate came into the community, it changed things. And that's where affordable housing was uh, for young families started. They were a growing district. And so they initiated the change. So the district didn't initiate it. It was brought on them. And then after the grand jury report and some cross action lawsuits against district to district and everything else, the state legislature got involved and said, this is not, this is, we're going to solve it for you. And I think Steinberg, basically took the legislation at hand and said, this is what it's going to be. The election will be happening. And the election was called and the voters made it happen. So it's important that you have the, the leadership of the districts at the forefront of this because having it done to you is different than doing it yourselves collaboratively. Am I remembering it wrongly that there was a Sonoma County grand jury report on the number of school districts in our county? Not? Yes, in 2000, uh, when I came into office, 2010, there was one done. And the report basically said, there's two reports. One basically saying one size shoe doesn't fit all districts, which is true. Because if you look at some of the geographic locations of our district, you couldn't unify them. I mean, it just, it's impractical. So the idea of, Matt was looking at unification as it related to the county, countywide, dividing it up into sections, and it didn't make sense. Uh, putting Kashaya and Horicon with Cloverdale wouldn't work. Okay, so that was a greater. That was a greater area. Report. Okay. All right. So um, thank you, Dr. Harrington. At this point, we are going to open this up to um, public comment. So if Sorry. anyone would like to um, comment on item E1, please raise your hand by clicking the raise hand button. This is public comment for item E1. And President Fong, there are no hands raised. All right. Um, Board members, this is an action item. We can uh, take more discussion or we can take a motion. President Fong, I wanna get clarification from Dr. Harrington. Um, on our resolution, it may need to say unification and consolidation, not just con consolidation. I'm not sure. Well, con it should say unification because to cons if you consolidate, you can only consolidate two like districts, Diane. Okay. So you would so, have to consolidate your elementary with another elementary. Okay. So and then high uh, school district alone. So, so I don't know what you're asking. Yeah. No. It's it. I was mistaken. So uh, That's what you said. nuance of the words are so different. I know. I know. So unification. Uh, board, board members. Yeah. I think when you if you make the motion, uh, the resolution needs to be amended to say unification rather than consolidation. The resolution. So just please keep that in mind. So do we need right, to- So we're in discussion now and I see uh, Director Medina's hand up and then Director De La Cruz. Yeah, I'd like to move that we adopt the resolution um, for San Jose City School District requesting a unification feasibility study and that any reference to consolidation um, be changed to unification within the resolution. And I second that. Thank you. And is there any other discussion on this? All right, seeing none, let's, uh, Adina, may we have that roll call vote, please? Director Lopez. Aye. Director Medina. Aye. 
Director De La Cruz. Aye. Director Manieri. Oh, she's not here. Um, Director Sheffield. Aye. Director McCormick. Aye. Director Flores. Aye. President Fung. Aye. Thank you. That passes. It was uh, six, six eyes. Thank you, Dr. Harrington, very much. Thank you. And you there are 14,500 teachers that need shots. Our yeah. Educators, school, school employees that need shots that we're working on. So that's what I, just, you, I know you said I was going to answer that question. Yep. Say so thank you. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for all the future work, too, Dr. Harrington. Okay. Thank this you. is the beginning, right? This is just the beginning. All right. Thank you very much for being here with us. We are moving on to um, discussion item E2, safe routes to schools. Yes, we are uh, bringing uh, back as we have promised safe, route, safe routes to school so we can continue this partnership um, no matter if we're in a pandemic or not. Um, and so I turn it over to Dr. Guzman for um, presentation of this um, item. Thank you, Dr. Kitamura. Uh, tonight, Director Evans with Tina Panza from Safe Routes to Schools will be presenting um, a presentation about our partnership and also how it's been working in our current pandemic. So with that, I actually turn it over to Director Evans. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, President Fong, uh, members of the board, Superintendent Kitamura. Uh, Tina Panza, Director of Safe Routes to Schools, and I are here this evening to provide information for you about the Safe Routes to School program, which provide, provides bike and pedestrian safety for students. So I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Panza, and she's going to start the PowerPoint. Yes, thank you. Um, let me get my screen share up. And start that PowerPoint. Thank you so much, uh, Elizabeth and uh, the Santa Rosa City School Board and Dr. Kitamura for inviting me to share information today about Sonoma County Safe Routes to School and our status in the Santa Rosa City School District. Everybody feel free to like wave your arms around and like stand up and sit down if you want to just get a little bit of movement in there. It's oh, we're all about movement. So, um, you know, the, the primary goal, you, you may know this already, but the primary goal of Safe Routes to School is to increase the number of families who utilize active and alternative transportation to and from school and in their neighborhoods. But most importantly, it's to teach them how to do so safely, whether school's in session or not. So it's relevant even during a pandemic, especially right now with so many more family walking and bicycling. Um, when the Sonoma County Bike Coalition, my employer and I launched the program back in 2008, we had a grant serving four schools and we now serve over 60 schools in the county and we are hosted by the Sonoma County Transportation Authority. So it's an official program of Sonoma County. Um, before I get into the program details and what we've been doing, um, this year, I just wanna take a moment to share why Safe Routes to School initiatives are important. First of all, they, they really work. Um, studies have shown that comprehensive Safe Routes to School programs do increase the percentage of students who walk and bicycle to school, and furthermore, that they're safer doing so. One New York City study, for example, found a 44% decline in pedestrian injury among school children in areas where safe routes to school projects and programs were in place compared to no change in locations without that. And more active transportation among families results in lower transportation costs for school districts and families and obviously reduced traffic congestion and all that's a net positive to the health of our students and for our environment. So not only are students who walk and bike to school healthier, just by the benefit of having more physical activity, but our air is cleaner and we reduce greenhouse gas emissions, 
Um, and over the last 25 years among kids ages five to 14, there's been a 74% increase in asthma cases and children exposed to traffic pollution are more likely to have asthma and permanent lung deficits and higher risk of heart and lung problems as adults. Finally, um, student health has been linked to academic performance and walking and biking to school is one way to help ensure that students arrive ready to learn. Um, and just a little tidbit is that some San Francisco programs with supervised walking school bus programs have even been shown to reduce student absences and tardiness. So lots of reasons for safe routes to school programs to be in place. We have been working, we've been partnering with schools in the Santa Rosa City School District from the beginning of our program back in 2008. In fact, it was a parent at Proctor Terrace Elementary School who showed me how to coordinate my very first International Walk and Roll to School Day event um, because that event actually predated the program. Um, and this year, our County Safe Routes program is providing support to eight schools in Santa Rosa City School District. Those schools are highlighted on this slide. Um, schools do need to apply each year between the months of February and April. We, that's the priority period um, to receive services. And we customize those services to each school based on our capacity and the school needs. Um, and there's definitely, you can see from the chart, there's definitely room for growth in the Santa Rosa School the City School District, particularly in the middle school population. It'd be really good to, to reach more middle schoolers. Um, in the Sonoma County program, we normally utilize tallies, which ask students how they travel to and from school, as well as GIS student address maps that both determine the status of and the potential for active transportation at a site. This, this data gives us insights into the difference between how many kids currently walk and bike to school and how many might be able to in a perfect world. And we share this data that we collect each year with the schools, the school district, and the city of Santa Rosa and the county. Um, and it can be really useful like in spring 2020, thanks to cooperation from our partner schools and also Elizabeth Evans, we were able to provide uh, a number of Santa Rosa City School GIS maps to the Santa Rosa City Public Works Department for their active transportation grant application for the community connector bridge um, over the Santa Rosa Junior College. So that type of data and this kind of collaboration definitely strengthen that grant application. We don't know if it's been awarded yet, but fingers crossed that they get the award. Um, and we, we just, we also utilize data like this, uh, as well as other factors like school demographics and location to determine which encouragement and education services would be the best fit in any given site. Um, so I wanna delve a little bit more into those available services now. So uh, the services we provide include support for encouraging families to walk, bike, and carpool to school. We also do fourth grade on bike skill and safety classes that we call rodeos. Um, we have second to fifth grade classroom bike and ped safety lessons. We do middle school bike safety lessons and youth engagement. We do community education and outreach and we have family bike workshops and rides. Any school in Sonoma County that applies for services is then eligible for support. Um, although we can't provide every service to every school, we, we basically, we do our best to meet schools where they're at and provide support toward whatever their program goals are through these services. So just as an example, in the pre-COVID world, our encouragement services included supporting schools and holding walk and roll to school day events like International Walk and Roll to School Day in October and monthly or even weekly walk and roll days where students are like incentivized to walk and bike to school and greeted with a welcome table and things like that and prizes. We also have led youth engagement teens go green clubs at the middle school level and supported schools in competitive challenges like the Golden Sneaker Awards and the Green Sneaker Challenge. Um, in 2019 and 20, before the pandemic hit, 
11 Santa Rosa City Schools participated in one or more, mostly more, of our encouragement initiatives. An average of 35% of students in attendance at those schools walked or rolled in our annual launch event, which was the International Walk and Roll to School Day, compared to maybe like 15% that walked on a normal day, 15 or 20. Um, our pre-pandemic bike and safety education programs served eight schools in the district last year. We conducted in-class education with the second and fifth graders at all the schools listed on this slide, with the exception of Santa Rosa French Charter who opted to receive a Saturday family bike workshop um, instead of in-class lessons. And the remaining schools on the list received or were scheduled to receive a fourth grade bike rodeo. You can see some pictures of that on the slide, um, with the exception of Santa Rosa Charter for the Arts who just had classroom education only. Unfortunately, due to COVID, we had to cancel three of our seven scheduled fourth grade rodeos last year. And of course, due to the pandemic, our in-person events and services aren't possible. So we've had to pivot quite a bit this year, but we've done it really well, I think. So let me explain how we pivoted. We have shifted this year our walk and roll to school encouragement program to a virtual walk and roll to anywhere program. So We've had monthly walk and roll anywhere days on the first week of each month since October. We've also had a corresponding monthly walk and roll to anywhere challenge activity at each month, which gives kids a chance to win a fun prize. Like in November, we had pumpkin pie as a prize. And this month we had a scooter skateboard in December, a scooter skateboard or roller skates. Um, and because everything's virtual, we created a variety of promotional resources to support schools in virtual outreach through their newsletters and their websites, their social media, and through classroom teachers just to make it super easy for them. And we also provide schools with monthly reports on their participation data and suggested actions to take to engage teachers or students in ongoing programming. This uh, slide, this page is an example of our December Walk and Roll Anywhere Challenge. We created a packet of scavenger hunts and encourage kids to get outside and explore their neighborhoods. All of our monthly challenges are creative and or active. They're all away from screens and they all highlight the benefits of active transportation to health and the environment and our community. So our goal is to really get kids out and moving and off screens. Except for this one little thing, which is our virtual education, we have also pivoted this year to continue to provide elementary and middle school students with bike and pedestrian safety education. We've developed a series of synchronous live Zoom courses and quizzes for the second, fourth, fifth, and middle school students, which we're already scheduling and we've been implementing since October through our participating schools and teachers. For equity reasons, we also developed corresponding asynchronous videos and quizzes for all those grade levels. And we set up a new education portal where students or teachers can securely access the video courses and quizzes. And so far, the lessons have been super well received by uh, the students and the teachers. They're only like two half hour lessons, so it's really short. And students seem to love having a different visitor in their virtual classrooms. We make the classes really engaging and fun and colorful and um, interesting. And um, generally our elementary school classes are with classroom teachers and our middle school classes are with PE teachers. But we're always open to offering webinar style lessons outside of classroom teacher time if there's interest from a school in that. Um, and we've shifted our community bike education to the virtual realm as well. And we developed a series of virtual family bicycling workshops, which are targeted to parents and kids. Um, these workshops have been really well attended and fun. Um, we do about up to four a month. Um, and we really super appreciate when our school partners promote them through their channels. Most of our registrants have heard about the workshops through either their school or through the local newspaper. So we really depend on that partnership to get the word out about these opportunities to be educated. And finally, I just wanna give you a heads up that soon we're gonna be offering in-person on bicycle classes through the Santa Rosa Park and Recreation Department, as well as in Windsor Park and Rec and in Petaluma. 
Classes in Santa Rosa are going to be taking place weekly on Friday, starting at about February 26th is our first class um, in Santa Rosa and actually January 27th is our first class in Petaluma and Windsor. Um, so weekly on Fridays, registration will be through Santa Rosa City Parks and Rec. Um, there is a small fee through the Parking Rec of about $5. I think it's $5 a person, but you know it's just for their administration. And any support and sharing information about these opportunities is something we, again, really appreciate from our partner schools and the district because it's all part of that education that can result in more active transportation and being comfortable riding their bikes um, in the neighborhood safely and reducing injuries too. So as you can see, the Safe Routes to School program provides many services that benefit schools and families in a variety. Oh. Um, there are a number of opportunities where we can strengthen our partnership even further. So I just wanna talk about that briefly and then we'll close it out. Um, first of all, I highly recommend the district continue to partner and collaborate with our program and the city of Santa Rosa to identify and pursue engineering projects that will make it easier to walk and bicycle. Uh, last year, um, Dr. Kitamura designated Elizabeth Evans to be district liaison to the Safe Routes program, and that's made a huge difference. Thank you, Elizabeth. She's provided essential support in getting us um, the data we needed for that ATP application I spoke of earlier with the GIS maps. Um, and these type of opportunities, they'll continue to arise. So having that district level support is super important. And in addition to that level of support, district staff or school board members can help connect principals and teachers or parents with the program, uh, encouraging them to get involved because they are the ones that kind of help spread the word and you know, make have a program have energy behind it. Um, in, in December, for example, Elizabeth invited me to present at a middle high school PE meeting, which could result in more opportunities to educate middle school students. So that was great. And um, next, the district can also set policies around providing bicycle and pedestrian safety education through PE programs, or just around generally supporting active and alternative transportation encouragement. School and district family coordinators can be a great liaison for Safe Routes to School. They have been, we've got a couple of the coordinators who have been involved in the program and they can potentially be tasked with encouragement activities from establishing carpool connections to helping coordinate walk and roll events or community rides, um, or just like letting parents know what's going on. And finally, policies around school siting and inter-district transfers have a huge impact on school travel that everyone should be aware of. The more we can encourage and enable families to utilize their neighborhood school, the more likely we are to reap the benefits of active transportation. So I just wanna thank you all. I know it's such a challenging time. Safety is a huge priority for all of us, whether it's COVID or bicycle and pedestrian safety or safe routes to school. So I just hope we all keep that in mind. Um, and thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to present. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have um, at this time. Thank you, Ms. Panza. So I'm gonna turn it over now to the school board. So school board, thank you so much, Tina, for that. Can we see ourselves again? Oh, I can stop the share, sorry. Sorry about that. Forgot it was me that was sharing. <laughs> All right, so this is a discussion item to be, we have questions and then we hear public comment. Uh, Director De La Cruz and Director sure. Sheffield. Thank you so much, Tina, for such a good presentation. Um, we were all sad to miss our amazing walk and roll events this year. It is like a highlight, um, definitely at Proctor um, for so many parents and kids and um, really creates a beautiful sense of community. Um, and, and, you know, it's funny, even those people who typically drive their kids over across the 101, um, park down the street and make sure that they're part of the walking. And it's, it's just, it is a real kind of community builder. So I'm just grateful for all of your work. And um, and one of the questions that I'm getting from um, from my, my constituents here at home is, will the fourth grade bike rodeos be <laughs> rescheduled <laughs> for the fifth graders to participate with, oh, with the God. fourth graders next year? <laughs> 
That is a great question. Um, you know, we, I don't know, but we can definitely discuss that and figure out if there is a way to accommodate some of the fifth graders. Okay, um, because my fourth grader who was already kind of passed through that opportunity, um, his little sister saw him have a blast at the fourth grade bike uh -huh. rodeo and she does not want to miss it. And she will be a fifth grader next year, unfortunately. Right. Um, the other question that I have, and this kind of follows on our last conversation, I was really um, excited about, you know, what you said about how school siting policies and kind of interdistrict transfer policies have everything to do with, you know, incentivizing people to, um, to really, you know, take advantage of what it feels like to be part of a neighborhood school and, you know, how um, how much that facilitates um, connectivity to your local community and walking and rolling to your local school um, is definitely easier when you're in your neighborhood school. And so I was just wondering if you have any examples of ways in which, um, you know, safe routes to school has played a role in um, the advocacy or in the development of those kinds of policies. Um. I don't have a specific example of where Safe Routes to School has advocated specifically, but I do know that a role of the Safe Routes to School program is to raise awareness about that issue and to get parents involved and to get people um, thinking about that issue and more able and more, more having the data to back up, you know, why those decisions would be beneficial to make, if that makes sense. Totally. I'm, specific, I'm oh. sure there are some, I just off the top of my head, can't think of it. I, I think that would be amazing for us to look at and to do a yeah. scan statewide. Um, and Elizabeth, maybe this is something that we can do as we're looking at you know, consolidation and, mm -hmm. um, and new middle school boundaries and how you know, some of these boundaries can really also um, facilitate and strengthen um, safe routes to school and good planning for transportation for kids who are walking and rolling. Um, there are definitely just sort of related to that. There are school district schools that have implemented policies about um, drop off, like where you cannot drive within a certain area around a school. Like there is a school in um, Mountain View that actually has parking like off parking drop-off places where you literally cannot drive to campus mm. at all at this is a middle school. And there's schools in Canada that have similar policies that are basically like you can't drive in the school neighborhood. So that forces people to have that school zone be safer with less congestion, less pollution, um, less safety conflict <coughs> issues. And so that's definitely a trend that has happened in certain areas of the country and in certain schools. It doesn't work for every school, but like if there's a school that has a particular issue that where there may be drop off sites that would be logical, that's something that's been done. And then my final, final question, I promise, um, is, you know, I know that we have, you know, identified, at least in our little neighborhood, you know, those areas that are particularly difficult for kids to make their way through on their own, like the, you know, the Cottingtown underpass, um, 4th Street, you know, the, the crossings on 4th Street, um, and so I'm just wondering, um, you know, have there been any um, further developments with regards to, you know, some kind of speed diets, especially in this time of the pandemic when so many more kids and people are using the streets and there are less cars on the road, at least there were, yeah. you know, kind of earlier in the, in the shutdown. And if there has been any more, um, I guess, like further development with the city um, in partnership with Santa Rosa City Schools about, you know, speed diets, road diets, mm -hmm. um, closing a lane on 4th Street, um, you know, d building in additional bike lanes on that Cottingtown yeah. underpass. Um, we have done a lot of that. I mean, technically, we're not an advocacy um, program because we're federally funded. So we technically can't do advocacy, but we have been involved with many, many um, meetings and providing information and support to advocates for making improvements. We've done walking audits. We've been parts of different studies. I know the city of Santa Rosa has been pretty, um, has been interested and expressed more, has expressed more interest recently in doing improvements at 4th Street. We actually recently had a whole visioning study um, this past year of both 4th Street and College Avenue, and they invited some uh, planners from UC Berkeley 
uh, to come in and do a, a rep doing like a recommendations report of that area. And, um, and so that once you have like studies that have been done, they can then use those for grant applications that will strengthen, you know, applications to get funding for those types of projects. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a long-term process. I know another study that was recently done is over at Stony Point, which isn't really Santa Rosa City School District, but that's a very dangerous area that affects a number of schools in the Wright District and the Roseland District um, that Santa Rosa has been looking into improving as well. But it's really about, I mean, one of the things we do in Safe Roots is identify those issues you know, get parents, tell us what the problems are, make, you know, make reports or make note of it, communicate that to public works, attend the BPAC meetings, you know, attend, you know, talk, keep an open line of communication with public works to try to uh, encourage them to, you know, apply for funding for projects when those opportunities come up. So I can't give you, again, specific information about Santa Rosa City Schools and what they're doing, but I know that they're interested because they just had that study, that visioning project, and um, it's on their radar for sure. So Fourth Street is definitely on their radar. Great. Thank you so much, Tina. Um, and I'd like to move to extend the meeting until we're through the agenda. I'll second that. All right. So thank you. Let's Can I board. add a friendly amendment to the motion? and say we extend it to 11, which I think is reasonable with what we have on the agenda. You accept that, Director De La Cruz? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Director Sheffield? Yes, all right. Uh, let's do a voice vote, all those aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Who was that? Yes, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Director Sheffield had his questions next. Yes, well, um, thank you, Tina, for the presentation. And thank you, Elizabeth, for lending your support and your skills. Um, the first question I have is I'm wondering why we don't have more schools participating. What are the barriers or the obstacles? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, in order for a school to participate, there needs to be a champion at that school that can hold the program. So sometimes that can be an issue, um, just that there isn't a parent or there isn't a teacher who's, or the principal is overwhelmed with other things that they can't kind of take that on. And we do our best to try to like find those champions ourselves, but really it's, it's, it's more up to the schools to, to bring us those champions. So that's one issue. Another issue is in Santa Rosa, there are a few schools that aren't super walkable, bikeable, like Steel Lane, um, you know, Burbank is, most of the students are bust. Um, I think Brook Hill is similar. Uh, so schools like that are not as engaged with the program because they don't take on the walk and roll element so much, however, we do work with schools that don't have a large student population that walk and bike. And we, again, we customize the program to their needs. They may not get a bike rodeo, but we might do an assembly with the students or we might do some classroom ed or do a, you know, a carpool to school day or something like that. So all those schools could potentially be involved if they had the desire or you know, had a champion that okay. could or be our liaison. We need somebody to communicate with at the site. Well, and this is a follow-up question and maybe an opportunity for a plug because you had mentioned the um, the window for schools to apply February right. to... Yeah, the, that's okay. I should probably modify that for this COVID year, but our normal window, our priority registration window is between February and the end of April. Um, last year, we extended it to the end of May. This year, we may extend it further. <laughs> yeah. um, we don't, we're not really, the only reason for the prayer, the registration system is because some of our services are limited. So like we can only do a certain number of bike rodeos a year. So we, ha and we have to know who we're doing them with and we have to be able to choose those schools well ahead of time. So we need the applications in for that purpose. But other than the, those services, we, and we also have to know how many incentives to buy. I guess that's another reason we have to buy those way in advance too. But other than that, like we can bring schools on pretty much any time of the year. It's just, they aren't necessarily guaranteed a service that's limited. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
No other questions. Uh, we are going to open this up to public comment at this point. If you, excuse me, if you would like to comment on item E2, please raise your hand by clicking raise hand on the bottom of your screen. And it looks like, oh, we have a hand. Um, Maura Ryan would like to speak. All right, perhaps she did not. Uh, Maura, if, if you did raise your hand, please raise it again. It looks like Elisa Haley was brought over, not Maura. And perhaps that hand was just raised by mistake. So it looks like we do not have anyone who wants to comment on item E2. Well, thank you again, everybody. I know it's been a long meeting and I really appreciate you guys taking time to have me Sorry, um, President Fong, uh, it looks like Maura is back with a hand raised. Apologies to you, Maura. Oh, no worries. I just couldn't unmute, I think. So can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just I I adore this program. Um, my we we live far away because we go to a charter and we're not we don't have a lot of sidewalks. But I um, was a very good friend of the founder of the national partnership and um, her passion and uh, dedication for improving the health of children and families and our whole society. I just want to pay that forward and. I would support um, anything we can do to continue or expand the program. It's just so positive and valuable. So thank you. Thank you, Maura. Come be one of our champions at a school. <laughs> Sounds good. Are we, is that it, moderator? Yeah. It looks like that's it. Anyone else want to comment on item E2? And there are no hands. All right. Um, this is discussion only. So any other discussion uh, comments from board members? And Dr. Uh, Dr. Sheffield. Just a, just a couple of comments I, I, I want to say, because you know I've heard from some folks in the community um, who have wondered why uh, Safe Routes to School is, you know, this is a discussion item on the agenda tonight in the middle of a pandemic when kids aren't uh, even going to school. And I think the answer, and, and much of it was in the presentation, um, is, you know, first of all, it's a commitment that the district made, maybe in better days, um, but the relationships that um, have been developed and are being developed, um, you know, as Tina pointed out, with the city of Santa Rosa, Sonoma County, Caltrans state agencies, federal agencies, elected officials, um, grant funding cycles and funding opportunities, we need to keep this momentum going. Um, I mean, for the reasons again, that, that Tina pointed out in the presentation okay. of the benefits that we get out of this, um, you know, some of them really stood out like improved academic performance um, and, um, and reduced uh, absenteeism and tardiness, um, healthier students. I mean, th these are all goals that we have but then there's bigger, um, you know, maybe that, that extend beyond our school community and go into our greater community is traffic congestion, issues that are day to day, despite, you know, the pandemic. Um, so I wanted to point that out to answer, you know, some, some questions um, that, that uh, you know, I, I saw come in prior to this meeting about this particular agenda item as a discussion item. Um, and then this is something that I, I, I wanted to point out was that, you know, it, it, last last winter, it, last, actually into the spring, the early part of the pandemic, bicycle sales were so high during these early months of the pandemic that there were months long waiting lists. So yeah, there still are. are. Kids are learning to be outside again. Kids are learning to ride bikes. I don't know if you guys have seen these bicycle gangs that are that are around the, around town. 
you know, some of them are masks, some of them are not. But my 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 only fear is that 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 my 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 eight year old is going to disappear. He's going to join one of these bicycle gangs, and and it's gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna be seeing him, you know, in the downtown without a mask on, and I'm gonna yell out the window and say, "How come you kids aren't wearing masks?" Um, but uh, anyway, I, I I just I want to thank you um, again, Tina, and and thank you, Elizabeth. I think this is a, a great program, a great partnership that we have with you, um, and um, want to do everything I can to to keep it going, build momentum, and expand the program. So thank you. Thanks, thanks so much, Ed, for your support. Uh, you've just been such a huge supporter for years, so appreciate that. A masked bike gang. Like, are the parents, are you putting GPS trackers on your kids? Okay, don't answer. Um, yep. Thank you, <laughs> Tina and uh, Director Evans. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. <laughs> All right, great. Moving on. We have until 11 o'clock. We have one hour now. Okay. We have a public hearing regarding Santa Rosa Teachers Association, SRTA, contract reopeners for 2021-22. So, um, Dr. Keto Moore, do you want to say anything about this before I open the public hearing? Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead and start the public hearing. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. I have something for that. Okay. Public hearing is now open. Anyone who would like to comment during the public hearing item E3? please raise your hand at this time. And Catherine Howell will be the first to comment. Good evening, everybody. I guess I could say good night. Um, it's late, it's my bedtime. Um, but President Fong, Dr. Kitamura, members of the board, um, I'm Catherine Howell. I'm a teacher at Lawrence Cook Middle School and the chief negotiator for SRTA. And tonight, SRTA stands together to sunshine openers for our collective bargaining agreement. Our proposals seek improvement in the learning conditions of, for our students at all levels. Our students have gone through unprecedented trauma in the past few years and they need support and they need stability. Support through smaller classes, more time for parent communication, less movement of teachers, fewer combination classes, uh, especially at the elementary level to prepare them for the rigor of high school. Our students need stability, stability by creating a destination district with competitive total compensation. So teachers come to Santa Rosa City Schools and stay in Santa Rosa City Schools. Right now, educators can drive across town they can drive up the highway a little, way, a little ways to Healdsburg, to Windsor, and they can get better compensation for their families, secure salaries, better health care. Um, so specifically, we are opening tonight with a proposal for a three-year increase to our salaries of a total of 15%, uh, starting with 9% and 3% over the next two years. Uh, in 19, 2019, 2020, Santa Rosa City Schools average salary was $77,000. The state average salary at the same time period was $84,000. We are well below state average for salary. Shockingly, we are 350% below state average for healthcare in this district. Uh, Santa Rosa City Schools pays about $4,000 per educator towards our medical benefits, where just up the road, the average is 14,000. Statewide, the average is $14,000 per educator. So we are proposing an 85-15 split in the cost of healthcare, meaning the district pays 85%, the member pays 15%. Um, not dropping below the current contribution of $6,800. I hope that you will read the letter in detail. We're asking for changes in class size. We're asking for more prep time for some of our educators. We're asking for more time for teachers and parents to talk to each other 
in elementary conferences. We're asking for fewer transfers for our teachers that disrupt the life of a school and the consistency of an education for our students. And we're also asking for some changes to our leave of absence provisions, um, leave of absence agreements that are disadvantaged women, our primary, uh, you know, majority of our educators right now in the district are women, and yet their leaves hurt them every time. Thank you, Catherine. Your time is up. Thank you. The next comment is from Janelle. Janelle, could you please state your full name for the record? Good evening. My name is Janelle Payne. And I am a teacher at Montgomery High School and been in the district now for 16 years. Um, and I just wanted to speak briefly tonight to say ditto to everything that Catherine just said, um, but also uh, just to urge your, your strong support in getting uh, Santa Rosa teachers to the state average and total compensation. And uh, for some of you on the board who have made uh, made promises, right, to support getting teachers up to the state average, uh, moving in that direction to keep those promises um, and, uh, and to support this proposal. So thank you. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who'd like to comment during the public hearing item E3? Please raise your hand. President Fong, there are no hands raised. I wanna thank the folks who are hanging in there with this late date at, at E3. So thank you. All right, public hearing is now closed. Um, we're moving on to E4, which is our action, which is the approval of the proposed Santa Rosa Teachers Association SRTA contract reopeners through Sunshine for 2021 slash 22. Um, Dr. Kitamore, are we asking questions of district so staff? Yeah. yeah, President Fong, I'll have um, Assistant Superintendent Chanel speak to this item. Thank you, Dr. Kitamura. Good evening, Board President Fong, Superintendent Kitamura, members of the board and attendees. We present to you tonight the proposed Santa Rosa Teachers Association or SRTA contract reopeners or sunshine for 2021 to 2022, of which said proposals will be addressed through the meet and greet negotiation process. As part of the collective bargaining process, employee associations annually submit contract revisions they wish to discuss and negotiate. The initial proposal for 2021 to 2022 contract reopeners include the following articles to negotiate. Article two, association rights. And please forgive us as this was inadvertently left off of the list in the public posting. Article six, which is hours and days of employment. Article 11, leave of absence provisions. Article 13, transfers and reassignments. Article 14, class size, and Article 16, compensation. The district looks forward to working collaboratively with SRTA to serve the students of Santa Rosa City Schools. Thank you. All right, do I see hands up from board members? Questions on that? Uh, Director Medina. Oh, Director just for some clarification. First, the clarification is, um, since we have a public hearing, do we do public comment again? Uh, no. no. I don't remember. Um, and my second question in terms of a motion to come, do we approve the proposed uh, contract re reopeners or do we approve like, like acceptance and receipt of them? in terms of what an appropriate motion. You're, you're in receipt of them. We are in receipt of them. 
then then I'd like to move to ac accept receipt of the proposed Centers Teachers Association Sunshine Contract Reopeners for 2021-20. Second. So I wanna just make sure we have taken care of process. Were there any other questions from board members? Yes, uh, Director, uh, Clerk, Director Everett Flores. <laughs> So a, a, a couple of clarifications here. Uh, I am an English learner, English is a second language here, but um, I, I think in your summary and your abstract, uh, the word meet and greet, uh, it's the wrong word that, that you used during um, actual negotiations. I believe you, you meant to write um, meet and confer, um, and um, but I could be completely wrong. So, um, and then, the second thing I wanted to say is more of a comment, uh, you know, um, that yes, we, we do have to do better as a school board. And then I know a lot of us, you know, are um, in par with what, you know, some of, with what the previous board said to, um, to SRTA that we, we put our teachers first and, um, and, and we are committed to make sure that, um, you know, we retain the best teachers by being able to compensate them pretty well. So, um, and, 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 and that has been a commitment of this board uh, from the last negotiations. And I just want to reiterate that, that, um, that you know, the board has heard you loud and clear and uh, we plan to um, do that in, in this next round of negotiations. Thank you. I am going to say that this is a regular action item and we did have a public hearing, but Dr. Kitamura, I think we should still have public comment. But the public comment is about the um, sunshine. So the sunshine. I wanna make, the, it, I wanna it's make public. sure people, okay. We had a public comment. We, we don't need another one on this one. You're not because no. you have a set public hearing. Okay. So any other questions? So there's a motion on the table by uh, Director Medina to, um, it was receipt, right? Mm -hmm. Approval. To accept receipt of the proposed. Mm -hmm. To uh, receive? Sunshine contract reopeners. Not just just to, to receive? Mm -hmm. To accept receipt. Or receive. Of the proposed Centers of Teachers Association Sunshine contract reopeners for 2021. And I seconded it, President Fong. All right. Seeing no other discussion, uh, Atina, might we, may we have a roll call vote on that, please? Director Lopez. Aye. Director Medina. Director Medina. I said aye. Okay. Director De La Cruz. Aye. Director Sheffield. Aye. Director McCormick. Aye. Director Flores. Dire uh, President Fong. Aye. Thank you, that passed. All right, thank you. Thank you to uh, Catherine Howell and to Assistant Superintendent Anna Chunel. We are moving on now to um, E6, excuse me, E5 and the action item. It's the Santa Rosa City School Board Communication Norms and Guide to Board Meeting Procedure. It's basically a review of what we have established before. We have a new board member and we're gonna be doing this, approving this in public. That, that's correct. So if you um, see this SRCS communication norms, um, because of uh, Director Flores to the board, we wanted to be sure that there wasn't anything else we might want to add or to edit uh, to norms now for this new governance team. And these yes. norms were created maybe possibly two or three years ago, I can't remember, but uh, we will finally be signing it again. 
it was created when um, Director Medina um, de la Cruz came aboard and McCormick. Okay. okay. Uh, and then, Director Medina. And there's another document, um, Guide to Board Meeting Discussion Action Items. Again, this is something that the board agreed upon, um, the old board agreed upon. And so we want to make sure that it still uh, withstands with this. Um, I see Director Medina's hand up. Um, well, a couple of things. Um, I never really liked when we changed it last time to add the duplicate discussions, but I think just given our previous item, um, I think this maybe should go back and, and be re-edited to add an item for public hearings. The, the process for public hearings, just to add a little more clarification. If it's going to be a guide, I think it should, you know, uh, uh, include all, all, all situations and, and public hearing, which is also tied to an action item, isn't specifically addressed. So if maybe that could be added somehow, just so that it's more clear in this type of situation. Yeah. Are you talking about this, the other document, Guide to Board Meeting Discussion Action Items? Was that it? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask any other questions or comments about that? I think that's reasonable, Director Medina. And I think we will bring this one back after you and I work on it. So then I, the, um, Communication norms, is, is that one fine? And we can move forward on that one, but we'll bring the other one back. Any is discussion that right? on that one? Okay, seeing none, can we, can we just, we can't do this partially, right? We have to just bring them both back. No, you can do one or the, you can do just one of them. Because someone can make a motion just to do the communication norms. Okay. So I'd move to adopt the board's communication norms. Second. Um, any other discussion? Wait, 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 you have to and bring back the other item. All right. Maybe, maybe Dirk. Can I add to the motion and bring back the, um, the um, guide to board meeting discussion the, action items. Uh, Director Medina. Friendly amendment accepted. <laughs> I think that, um, you know, just um, thinking about it right now and um, just looking at it in, in terms of communication norms, um, I think there's like stuff missing. And I think that's something that would help just, you know, if this is going to be like a long, a long term standing item, it's also citations towards existing board bylaws and stuff. Um, you know, I think I'm, I'm thinking in terms of like communication of the board and for the board as well. Um, kind of like, you know, how the president serves as like the voice of the board in public, things like that nature should be included in terms of communication norms. And so I think um, where some of these are tied to board bylaws and stuff, those citations should be referenced. So we could also just in the long term be, be better able to understand and have places to look for, for reference. Um, I think that would be a good practice. Um, so that's just my thoughts on It sounds like you are asking for more thought about this and it's really difficult to do that kind of thinking now at 1020 when we have 11 o'clock deadline. So it looks well, to me that- it's coming up on the agenda. I mean, can't control right. when it comes up. So- <laughs> Actually, I think what, uh, sorry, President Wong. Uh, I, I think that for the guide to board meeting discussion and actions, and I wanna know if I'm hearing this correctly, that we should take the time to fully annotate it in, in connecting it to our board policy and also add in the public comment process. Is that right? I wanna be sure I hear, I'm hearing it right. Uh, to, to which one are you talking about? Uh, the, guide, the guide to board meeting discussions first, that one first. Yeah, so on that one, you know, what, what initially sparked it was just the immediate thing that we just had happen about the lack of clarification right. around public hearings. So, but, but I think that the annotating and citing like board bylaws, I think it's, it's a good practice to include. Um, right. 
you know, right. at least that's something that I, I I like to refer to as well. Yeah, um, no, I think that I, I think that makes sense. This is a board document. It's in it's within gamut. I think that's makes total sense. This the school board communication norm. This was developed, but it you it could be. I'm sure it's connected to a BP, um, but it was really written by all of you. So except for Director Flores. So uh, we can attach, we can also attach the board, the board bylaw that this is connected to or uh, denoted. Is that what what we were you're saying? Or or maybe also the the title change because you know, initially just the title as Associate School Board Communication. And that seems very broad. And, and when you look at just what's included in here, it's more like communication uh, amongst each other and communication with yourself as superintendent. But when you think of just the title, communication norms, there's also like communication um, of the board to the public and other communication. So if maybe either a title changes to what's included, um, that's more specific. Or, or addition of those other communication norms that exist within bylaws and such. That's just kind of what I'm trying to point. Out. Okay. Can this also be, this might be appropriate for us to bring it back to our study session, the next one we're doing on um, goals for the board? Yeah. yeah, why don't you go ahead? I would, I would suggest tabling it to that meeting. Mm -hmm. I think, if I may, I would just add, um, if, if we're going to bring it to a study session, um, I wouldn't want to, personally, I wouldn't want to just bring it as is. If there's going to be some changes, maybe bring some proposed changes. If we want to just do this, I think we're going to be going at it multiple, multiple times if we're just going to bring this back. So that's just my, my thoughts initially. But yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Director Medina, I did not understand that point. Uh, basically, I'm saying if it's coming back at a study session, um, I'd prefer that maybe we bring back something to a study session that's been augmented with additional stuff, um, or or we look at like just the change of the title to see how it's coming back. Uh, you know. I, I don't know. I, I don't. I don't want to start off with where we're at, if that makes sense. But if we do, you know, we'll go from there. I just think we could do some stuff in between. Okay. I think I'll take advantage of the executive team, and we'll take a look at it before the study session and bring it then. All right, uh, Dr. Kinnamore, is that clear enough? Yeah. So you're gonna. You are going to table this to the next meeting, and in the meantime. You're going to work on some uh, edits and additions to it. So. With the executive team, and um, which would include the vice president and the clerk and me, and then bring it to the whole board at the study, at the February study session. Okay. Yep. So just the right. point of order there, just the point of order, there is an open motion, motion on the floor. So it would need. There's a motion and it's been seconded. Can we rescind? You, or do we I, I did you say rescind your second? Yeah. It's okay. The motion, so there's no second. All right. So the motion dies for lack of second. All right. Thank you. So you need to call for a new motion to table. Well, I think it's direction to, to staff and the executive committee to revise. Is, is Are we moving in that direction? Or are we just saying come back and there is no action a, beyond the direction? Motion, we need a motion for that to, to table or to direct staff? No. No, not to No, okay. No. But I thought, no, no. Okay, we're it done with this out. item. Yeah, we, we can just die and we'll just take the direction and bring it back. To okay. Seven. We're moving okay. on to E6. Yes. Let this me is get an action item. 
approval of CSBA board policies and administrative regulation updates for BP 3280, BP 3530, AR 3530, BP 3551, AR 3551, BP 3555, and E stands for Exhibit. Exhibit. 3555. Yes, so in the um, the uh, essence or the in the spirit of time, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, let you know that these are board policies for standard updates that are provided to us by CSBA. You're going to see, you haven't seen a group of them come through, this is a part of that same group. So. Any questions? Director Flores and Director McCormick. Yeah, while reading these um, updates, um, I, I'm wondering how SB 820, which is Assembly Bill or Senate Bill 820, will affect us on the Fort Ridge property and uh, in the use of its funds. <clears throat> So with, with this, what it did was relax the way that we could sell the property uh, and go through that process. So we have submitted the waiver to the State Board of Education, uh, which uh, when accepted and agendized and ultimately approved um, as the goal, uh, then we will be able to uh, have a faster path to sale of that property. The sale of the property uh, and the uses for that money were outlined in the agreement with uh, the city of Santa Rosa, and those will hold true. Uh, there was no state facilities uh, funds used with that property for the purchase, uh, purchase of or 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 anything. There's no construction on that property. It's a vacant piece of land, so we'll still use the agreement that we made with the city of Santa Rosa on the uses of that money. And, and there was a, a discussion about creating a, a committee. So there's no need for a committee either, right? Is that, is that, am I assuming that correctly? That's correct. Prior to this, the, uh, the sale of surplus property had to go through a surplus property committee formally, uh, otherwise, or also known as a 7-Eleven committee. Uh, and this relaxed that and we were able to use other board committees such as Citizens Oversight Committee. Okay. That, that met the requirement for committee. Okay. Thank you. Director McCormick. Um, I did not have a question. I was going to make a motion, but I think you need to do public comment first. We are going to do public comment. Are there any other questions? All right. Uh, moderator, are there any comments on this item from the public? So if anyone in the public would like to comment on item E6, please raise your hand. And there are no hands raised. You're on mute, President Fong. Director McCormick. <laughs> Um, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the approval of uh, CSBA board policy and administrative regulation updates for BP3280, BP3530, AR3530, BP3551, AR3551, BP3555, and E3555. Second. All right, so that was moved by Director McCormick and seconded by uh, Director Sheffield. Adina, may we have that roll call vote, please? Director Lopez. Aye. Director McCormick. Aye. Director Sheffield. Aye. Director De La Cruz. Aye. Director Flores. Aye. Director Medina. Aye. President Fong. Aye, thank you, that passes. Moving on to E7, this is an action item. Approval of CSBA board policy and administrative regulation updates for BP 6142.7, AR 6142.7, BP 6161.1, 
AR6161.1 and E6161.1. So again, I'm just for the sake of time, uh, this is being brought forward by um, teaching and learning. Um, and so we are updating policies again um, in accordance with CSBA updates. I'd like to move to approve the updates to BP 6142.7, AR 6142.7, BP 6161.1, AR 6161.1, and E 6161.1. Okay. Um, are there any questions about this from any board member? Director Flores. Yeah, I know, I know it's late, but when I read these, I was a little bit um, taken aback and quite, quite a few modifications here. And I don't know how really uh, the PE requirement will look like at the secondary level, if, if we're requiring, you know, students who have been exempted from um, PE to actually take PE if they have a, you know, a medical condition. So um, um, I don't know how that will look like. And, and I think we need guidance as to what the high schools. So Mr. Flores, I invited um, Elizabeth Evans um, back into the panelist as she oversees um, PE. And so if I understand your question is, if a child is exempt from PE due to a medical illness, how do they meet their requirement? Is that your question? Well, it says that they have to have PE now, uh, 400 minutes a week of PE. So how does that look like uh, if the kid is exempt from PE because of a medical condition? So um, it, it just doesn't, it, it, uh, there's a, it's congruency here. I don't, I don't, I don't understand how a kid could be put into a PE class when they're medically exempt. Correct. Well, uh, this is Elizabeth Evans here. Um, if a student is medically exempt, then they, sometimes what happens is if a student has been in the class and say that the student breaks their leg and they can't participate in the class, um, say they would have, um, they would still be enrolled in the class, but they would have, um, you know, assignments that were provided by the teacher in the, in that meantime. Um, so I guess if, are you thinking of something that, that like if a student was unable to participate over say several years, or I guess I need a little help. Right. Let me read what it says here. So, uh, <laughs> It's a requirement the students who have been granted a per permanent exemption from physical education, but if you've been granted a permanent exemption, you have a medical condition, mm -hmm. must still be uh, in a physical education course for at least 400 minutes uh, each 10 school days. So now we are going to ask uh, students who have medical exem exemptions to be in PE. That's, that's what I'm getting at. Oh, I see. I, yeah, I that's I, I don't believe that's the intention that the student if they're exempt that they would be in the PE class. Okay, so I, I like to have clarification on, on this, you know, um, because if a, if a kid is medically exempt from PE, this is saying that they have to be in PE uh, for mm -hmm. these four minutes. Um, and well, so um, can I, can I ask a clarification to that? Yeah, please. And, and the, the way that I'm reading it, it says they must still be offered physical education. That doesn't mean the way that I'm reading, they don't have to take it, but they must be offered it. Is there a difference there? Yes. Well, and, and we do have to offer PE. It has to, it, you know, just in terms of an equity issue, it has to be available for all students, even when students opt out of PE after they're, you know, they've done their two uh, years for their graduation requirement, we still have to offer four years of PE. So I think that's a, a good point, uh, Director Medina. Yeah so, yeah, so we're not forcing them into it. They're they're offered it, they could choose to take it, but they're not going to be mandated to have it like as a graduation requirement. Mm -hmm. So that's how I read it. Got it. All right. Thank you. That, that makes a lot more sense. Thanks a lot, Omar. Thank you. At this point, I'm going to open this up for public comment. If members of the public would like to comment on item E7, please raise your hand.
Last call for item E7. And there are no hands raised. All right, there was a motion on the table for this. If there's no other discussion, I think uh, Director De La Cruz made that motion. I'm not sure he, if it was seconded yet. Two people seconded. Who was that? I think it was Jill and Ed. Uh, it was and, and, <laughs> and Ever's raising his hand too. So Ever, we're gonna have you second it. Thank you. All right. Um, may we have that vote, please, Adina? Director Lopez. Aye. Director De La Cruz. Aye. Director Flores. Aye. Director Sheffield. Aye. Director McCormick. Aye. Director Medina. President Fong. Aye. All right, that passes. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for that question, uh, Director Flores, and the helpful um, explanation, Director Medina and Director Evans. We are on the F items, consent items, um, one through 10. Director Medina. Um, I, I, I think in an amendment to the agenda, I don't think we pulled item F1, but do we need to pull it to add uh, Director Manieri as a, to approve her absence? We don't need to if it's all part of one through 10. We usually pull it when we don't have anybody absent. But I think to specify her, because I don't think she's included, right? Would you clarify, Dr. Doc, uh, doc yes. Yes, you need to approve her absence. It's an approved absence. All right, so it's one and then it's two through 10. So let's start with one. Move to, move to F1. Approval of absent board member. Second. Um, if I could add a friendly yes. member, a friendly yes. amendment to specify uh, Director Manieri. Yes, please. Accepted, accept the friendly amendment. Second. All right, we are going to take a vote on this. Um, I mean. Uh, may I ask, uh, was Director Flores the one who seconded the motion? Yes. 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 Thank you. Director Lopez. Aye. Director just, just point of order, do, do we need public comment first? To, uh, uh, you know, I just made a decision. We're not going to take public comment on that, but we will take it on two through 10. Is that legal? You don't normally, oh yeah, you're right. It was a pooled item, so. It was a pooled item. So there yes. would be public. So there would be public comment. I just yeah. thought it was a little private. Yeah. It's just giving the opportunity to the public because it was a pool, it's a pooled item. Is there any public comment on item one? So if there's a member of the public that would like to comment on item F1, please raise your hand at this time. President Fong, there are no hands. You know, it's whether it's legal or not, it doesn't feel right because I don't think we've ever had comment on that on public, on uh, board members absences before. I'm just gonna say that. Um, can we have a vote on that, please? Director Lopez. Aye. Director McCormick. Aye. Director Flores. Aye. Director De La Cruz. Aye. Director Sheffield. Director Medina. Aye. President Fong. Aye. All right. I'm looking for, um, Questions or discussion on F2 through 10 or a motion? Move to approve items two through 10. Second. second. Okay, so that was moved by Omar Medina and seconded by uh, Director De La Cruz. Do we have public comment on items two through 10? If a member of the public would like to comment on items F2 through F10, please raise your hand. And there are no hands raised. All right, may we have that vote, please? Director Lopez. Aye. Director Medina. Aye. 
Director De La Cruz. Aye. Director Sheffield. Aye. Director McCormick. Aye. Director Flores. Aye. President Fung. Aye. Thank you. Those passed. We're on to G1. This is the approval of minutes of the regular board meeting held on December 14th, 2020. Director Medina. Yeah, I think um, just in the minutes, I think we need to include in, under attendees um, the, uh, the portion of Jenny Close being in attendance at the beginning, she was in attendance at the beginning of the meeting and then when Director Flores came in. Because I think under attendees, she's not listed for the first part, which she was. But she's not the voting member. So do you want it to be clarified that she was there? Well, yeah, I think she was included up until item more right before the swearing in, right? So she was voting up until that point. So wouldn't it need to be reflected? That's just my point. Yeah, the part that where it says voting member was why I left her off. We left her off. Yeah. Um, but we can. Well, if it doesn't need to be included, it's fine without. I'm just. I mean, I she's she's mentioned in the minutes as present as being recognized mm -hmm. for her service. Okay, that's cool. And, that's if we, and if we do this historically, it, it's it the same as we've been doing it every year before that. I just was that's going by book. I was just going, we, Adi and I were just going by voting member is why we did it that way. So. All right, so that was a question. Do I have a motion? Move to approve G1 approval of the minutes regular meeting held on December 14, 2020. Second. Who was that second by? Okay, thank you, Ever. So that was motioned by Jill McCormick and seconded by Everett Flores. Director Lopez. Aye. Director McCormick. Aye. Director Flores. Aye. Director De La Cruz. Aye. Director Sheffield. Aye. Director Medina. Aye. President Fung. Aye. Thank you. Are there any board member requests for information moving forward? Seeing no hands. Wait, um, Director Flores, did you have a request? Yeah, I thought that was under I-1 now. Um, yeah, that's, oh, sorry. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm wrong. All right, Director. so let's turn our attention to information items. No, no, no. D Director, I told uh, Director Flores incorrectly because he does have a, an item for future board members future board meeting or future board information. I told him I won instead of H. So Director H. Flores, what is your request? Yes, thank you. Okay. Thank you. So thank you. So I put it on oh, I won. So uh, I'd like to know more about the um, outcome petition. And um, you know, I, when I was looking at the uh, uh, at the uh, vendor uh, war warrants, it, you know, it looked like a large amount of money was going towards uh, busing. It was like, so <laughs> we don't have any busing. So I, I, I like to know um, the logistics of it as to why uh, we're spending $700,000 in, in the middle of COVID. So, um, and if there are any other, you know, options for transportation. So, um, so I <laughs> I, I think that this is a really good opportunity when, in, when meeting with um, Director Flores to um, just have an update on West County transportation and also for uh, he and um, uh, Director Lopez to hear more about how it all transpired and why we're in the position that we're in right now. So uh, we uh, will uh, have a board agenda item actually on this coming up. Uh, Probably not for a month or so because we just have so many things going on right now, um, but it will definitely be on the agenda um, in, the near, in the near future. Anything else? 
Uh, just to, just information in the information items we Emmy, just in the information items we have the uh, return of the AR um, five one two one and zero four seven zero four seven zero revised, and then you're going to see this IGP de demographic information built out um, every month to keep you apprised of what's happening with the numbers of students who are. Um, taking the intervention or, or having an intervention. So uh, just for your information, that's it. Can I add something for um, I-6? Sure. So uh, it would be nice to have a total number of the graduating class. Um, oh, that's right. Instead of just yeah. a number of that. We can have that. Thank you for remembering to do that or to ask that. Okay, that's it, President Fong. All right, everyone. Good night. And it is 15 minutes early from where we uh, said. All right. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.